Happy Monday, everybody. Yeah. Yo. There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Turns out I could talk better with my mic on. Turns out. Hey, Andrew. How you doing? Full. Oh, here we go. Oh, Sorry. Say again. Delightful. Nice. Good. Hello, everybody. It's May 24, 2021. We're going to get started in just a minute. Uh... Andrew, just so I'm not like uh, blindsided by it, did did they fly the SN15 again? No thumb wire. Cool. <laughs> secret, secret lights. Hushed lights. Um. Man, I'm excited. Excited for the week. Yeah, how uh we're not we're not on the record. We are live. We are live, yeah. But one thing we didn't talk about is how much faster we can get closer to saying the thing. I'm gonna take that to mean not at all. Hold off. <laughs> yeah. Fine. Not till we see the wrinkles in their forty year old eyes. Yes. Yes. Right. Got it. We are, uh, yeah. We can smell it. Huh? We can smell it. It's all we can do. Just smell how close it is. Okay. No, not five words. Brian gets five words on. on, on only on, on ghost, ghost attack. attack. Only on ghost attack. Which, by the way, I, I, I think we might be able to squeeze one in today, right? Maybe. I mean, you're, you're the one who always has back to back on Monday. I, uh, Recording a nine attack I, tonight? I, I, I spent yesterday, some might say wasting my time, watching <laughs> six different programs uh, for, for Cord Killer. So I'm all caught up, so I have time. Uh, well, yeah, we'll, we'll, I guess we'll have to figure that out after, uh, after we're done here. So I don't know what Bryce's sketch is. Yeah, we will figure that out another time. Not right but, uh, uh, yeah, man, tell you what. Uh, uh, crazy times, crazy times. Uh, my buddy JD Durkin uh, is getting a, a the first ever primetime show on the Cheddar Network. Oh, I saw that. He, he, uh, he, had you had him on the politics show? Is that how you met him? J J J JD, JD Durkin, Durkin is not and like I a are actually crazy... alums of uh, BitTorrent News. Mm. An old Bit, another mm. BitTorrent News alum. But I, I first, uh, I first met him doing that. But he's done great work on on Cheddar during uh, the middays and afternoons as a host. And now they're putting some some weight into uh, uh, making him their first uh, primetime uh program so i'm very very proud of him excited Hells yeah cool and jd durkin is not like code for katie dirks no no they just Although have hard k sounds yeah. in their in their in their name yeah and and they rhyme yeah yeah all right you guys ready to start the show yes ready ready all right <clears throat> andrew i'll count you in in three two 
Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm joined by Mr. Brian Brushwood. Hello, beautiful people. Mr. Justin Robert Young. Hello. And Mr. Bryce Castillo. Uh, thank you for introducing me, Andrew Main, who's also on the Pleasure. show. <laughs> Pleasure. I am on yeah. the show. I have a, I want to say a great email, Bryce, you, you sent it to me. Um, so we've been dealing with this. Herod. Hey, actually, uh, Andrew, sorry, can, if we can, for whatever reason, we're like getting a bunch of jump, you're, you're coming in really jumbled. Um, a lot of jump cuts. Let me, let me double check, make sure there's nothing obstructing my Wi-Fi. Okay, yeah. Uh-oh. He's going to find another gift, y'all. It's going to be a puppy this time. Just a little, little corgi. Dude, we're uh, in the Wi-Fi. We're at that um uh we're at that middle ground where it's like I feel like I could get away with just showing up with the puppy again for for pet for Bonnie. You want another one? I mean, you know, something to keep joyful excited. <laughs> <laughs> Plus also like sneakers is 17 and blind and we have to we have to we have to put like juice in his eyes you to, think you think I mean, he's still going to bury all of us. I know, I know. He's, he's going to outlive out all of the us. The Kaiser Soze of dogs, <laughs> man. Everyone else seems to have tragedy befall them. And who's there? Speaking of Kaiser Soze, uh, another leading role for It's Kaiser. not a leading role. I mean, what a weird story that was. It's like, look, I I, I don't think that I, I want to reward Kevin Spacey uh, in my life. But if he's going to do his friend's Italian movie, like... I don't know how much I care to he play, jump up He plays down. a pedophile. Does he? Yeah. Oh. Uh, that was what the headline said. Oh, I don't know. Uh, Andrew, can you, can you count to 10 for us, please? Yes. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I'm mm. trying to shut down a bunch of stuff here. because yeah. You sound good now. I want to make sure he gets enough speaking in so that we can... Yeah, I'm sorry. I should go keep talking. No, no. You... you so then when people you go like oh, i'm having trouble here and you're like how about now you're like i don't i don't know it's not enough of a sample for me to tell it's funny too because it's like uh, uh count to 10 it's like um oh it's a race is it one two three four five six seven eight nine ten there i did it I'm the winner the count of 10 winner uh um, all right yeah okay well uh seems seems okay Certainly. Yeah. Uh, do you want to just take it from the, the top again? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, just double checking everything here. No worries. I mean, I realize having like a billion, like. All right. Let me just open up one. Okay. You ready? Let's go. All right. I'm going to count you in for a redo in three, two, Hello, and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello. Mr. Justin Robert Young. Hey, friends. And Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, that's me. So I want to start off. Uh, we got a, a great email from uh, Tim Harrod. I think that's the way to pronounce it. And this is, I've seen this out there before, and it's great. It deals with, there's been a, a lot of UFO. Oh, right. There's a few UFOs circulating from the Pentagon or from military sort of circles, and it's got some people buzzing. And and I, I see some very smart people confused by this, some very smart people who are who have maybe perhaps jumped to conclusions. And uh, we talked about this before, and I'm not here to say, oh, it's not aliens, but I think we mentioned last time was with digital cameras, when they were new, we saw all kinds of crazy stuff, and now we're watching stuff that's shot with night vision and complex possibilities this triangular image this triangular uh you know, that had people really excited about how fast it moves around sorry andrew i i, I hate to do it to you but but you, you're yeah. chopping up again on us i don't i don't know um let me do let me do a reboot okay okay yeah right. we'll, we'll do that and i'll do a deboot that's my code for going to the potty. The bathroom. Yeah. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to be here. 
uh, uh, I'm gonna pre, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pre-boot, which I guess is what I'm gonna call drinking coffee. <laughs> How are you doing, Justin? Uh, man, you know, I had a, had a nice little weekend. Good. You want to know what I really, it really burned my, burned my biscuits. Mm. Was, uh, uh, so I bought a new, a scooter. Because okay. from where our place is, uh, you can walk. And I like walking, like, longer distances. And, and so I can get to a bunch of places walking. But if you want to kind of more like casually like me and the wife go somewhere it's it's very easy to scoot mm. and so we bought a new scooter a new Literally. scooter you had so what was the scooter you had previous we got just the spoils of the bay area where somebody just like i think literally somebody gave us a scooter because they were affiliated with the promo company that was giving away scooters and they had a scooter to give away so we got one uh then we got another one from Darren because he was liquidating his life as he lives in his van, uh, mm -hmm. youtube.com slash hack five uh, for his travel log. And then there was, uh, uh, and, and then that one broke for various annoying reasons. And then uh, there was a, uh, I, I just said, screw it. I'm just going to buy a brand new one. So the first time I take it out, boom, the front tire pops. So I got to replace the tire. And I think this is going to be, oh, you know, a little 15 minute uh, uh, thing here on the, on the weekend. You know, one of those little, mm. like, just things to do. It's just on a list, right? Yeah. So I look up a, a YouTube tutorial. I start, start wrenching, you know, figure out immediately that I don't have the, the, the right hex key mm. uh, thing. Mm -hmm. So now I got to go search through all my different things. I wind up finding it in a kit I have to disassemble computer and phone stuff specifically. It was so tidy. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. Then I just, for the life of me, can't get, um, I, I can't get one of the bolts off of the, ah. of the thing. And so I. Is this a Ikea thing? No, a scooter. Oh, got I got to replace a tire on a scooter. So I, I have like the, a, a dream literally last night that I'm like, take it to a bike shop. You wouldn't think about doing it because it's a scooter. Yeah. But well, all it is is doing the same, shop. the same thing that probably the same to tools. It's all just taking a, 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 a lug nut off and putting yeah. another thing in and they have the tire clamps to, to be like taking a easy. Take, taking a jeep to a car shop exactly and so uh so i did on the way in here i dropped it off and uh and that was pretty much uh, uh the story of my wasted saturday and my hopefully very exciting monday as at some point i will be uh i'll be leaving here and on the way out because it's right on 290 i can just pick up the scooter and it'll be ready to roll from a wasted Saturday to a basted Monday. A based Monday. <laughs> it is based. <laughs> the based. The most based day of the week. Exactly. Monday, Monday is based course. day is uh, a common phrase that many people say. We've all seen the Geico commercial. Yeah. yeah. About based There's always Monday. somebody in HR like, don't forget, Monday is Monday based is day. Monday is based day. Drop it like it's hot. <laughs> That's Garfield trying to, trying to make Monday Another based. Garfield but, oh. promo. Hello, Andrew. Hello. Uh, are you able to hear us? I can hear you fine. Awesome. Uh, you're coming in good, uh, as far as we can tell. For, for now. <laughs> uh, yeah, that 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 tricky internet, man. It sure is a fickle mistress. Yeah. A, a, mm -hmm. a ficky miss. So is my fickle mistress. <laughs> her name's Monday. No yeah. wonder everybody <clears throat> hates her. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I think uh, you you wanna you wanna take another try at it. Sure, for why reals not? This Since time. I've got the for practice. reals this We've time. That was good. Good re. Uh, 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 I was about to say rehab, but I meant uh, 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 rehearsal. Rebar. Good. Good rebar. Good rebar. All right. All right, Andrew. I'm gonna count you in to start the Weird Things podcast in three, two. 
Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. 50% iron oxide, rebar all the way. Mr. Justin Robert Young. Hey, friends. And Bryce Castillo. They call me Table Salt. (laughs) (laughs) Because you're white and ubiquitous? No, because uh, <laughs> when it comes to chloride, he's like, nah. When it comes to clo- when it comes to chloride, I'm like, sodium me up, because doctors can't agree if you're healthy. That's right. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> or how much we should deal with you in a day. <laughs> uh, so uh, we talked a little bit last week in a couple other episodes about some of this UFO footage we're seeing coming from the military. Yeah. And one of the points we've made before is that when digital cameras were new, we saw a lot of weird images, streaks, and all this other stuff. And uh, my girlfriend brought up a story the other day about how uh, some photo of some orb that was, you know, she was somebody, dude was on the Tim, on the Joe Rogan show talking about this. I'm like, yeah, I know how to do that. And I grabbed a camera and created the same exact photo because I'm like, you know, I used to have to play with these cameras and figure out how you can create these effects. Then it was just putting dust, you know, in the, the right, just dropping it. So anyhow... The problem is we're looking at footage that's through infrared, through all sorts of other imaging systems that are very complex systems. And that doesn't mean that there aren't UFOs, doesn't mean there aren't UFOs out there. But when you see some, I've seen some very smart people jump to conclusions because they assume the images of something that it's imaging and not something processed. I've seen stuff on my, like, looks exactly like a water drop on the, you know, on the lens. I've seen other stuff. I'm like this, and not to say that that is what it is, but much more easily explainable things. And sometimes we take the explanations other people give us as like, oh no, this person told me this. Like, ah, when I talk to experts sometimes on things, I find out that maybe they're a little bit outside their domain and we give them too much weight. Uh, so Tim Harrod sent us a great uh, a great link to a YouTube video, which I'd seen this explanation, I think, put up to on Reddit, which was great, which was showing that this triangular shaped UFO, if you've seen this footage of this thing, oh, it looks spooky, the thing moves around. But when you watch, you know, if you really notice, you see there's like a couple more ghost images in there. Yeah, right. And if you look at the YouTube video explanation, it's a it shows like this looks like a bokeh effect. Like there's a bright source that might just be right outside the range there. And if you look at the iris on this night vision system, it's got a triangular oh. iris. And so anything yeah. that's out of focus and, and, looks and, and, triangular. By the way, uh, one of the most precious moments in my life was during the recent uh, solar eclipse. Uh, that, that that happened um, after the eclipse ended. Uh, when you think of the dappling that you see through uh, various uh, trees, uh, you normally think of those as circles, uh, which they normally are mm-hmm. because that's the shape of the sun that uh, uh, through pinhole cameras is is shown down on the ground. But during a partial eclipse, it's all little moonlets. Uh, it, it's crescent, uh, uh, crescent moons everywhere. Right. So so that, that would make perfect sense that, that that's what that would be. Yeah, and, and again, the problem is that you get, and I, I talked to my buddy, uh, Paul Hynek, the other day. He is, his father's J. Allen Hynek, the guy who did Project Blue Book, where they would try to go through and try to account for a lot of stuff. And sometimes we talk about work. We may not know. We may not know what a thing is. But other times, the problem is, is people are very quick to rule out very simple optical effects because people forget, like, what happens from the lens to the image sensor. A lot of things, there can be a lot of other effects. You can have lights out of range. There are other stuff in there. So anytime it's just, oh, here's this weird image, it's one thing. And sometimes you hear stories of like, well, other people corroborated it, which might be the case, but we've seen in other events, things that we clearly knew were like Venus and other people reporting it weird that, oh, it was a UFO. And then like, nope, this is exactly where it was, et cetera. So it's very disappointing to a lot of people to hear this. And also you have some very public, very smart people who are afraid of looking stupid and will just sort of say, No, it doesn't account for that. There's more, the more, I'm like, fine, but case by case, you got to look at it. Well, and, and there really is a danger of, I'm going to say knowing too much, quote unquote. Like, I, I think that, that there are oftentimes people for whom are very expert at systems are very expert at, you know, a certain field that, uh, naturally, and I don't think this is a bad thing or it makes anybody, uh, uh, you know, stupid or anything, but you have to, for your expertise to shine through, 
believe you kind of know every step of things, and that can at times tend to make us the most blind to a little thing, a little thing that well, comes along. And, 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 I, and I think we get to those places as human beings in insidious half-step ways where um, let's say you originally go on to look at some weird footage and you propose some things, and one of the things of the five things you suggest turns out to be exactly right. Yeah. The newspaper headlines the following day say, Justin Robert Young totally called it. And now you're the guy who totally called it. And then you're brought on again. And it's like, maybe you're a little more careful. You do a little more research. But let's say again, it's like Justin Robert Young called it again. At some point, you perceive yourself as the guy who calls it. And then you become a little more brittle about wanting to make sure that you're right on these things. Instead of the guy who shrugs his shoulders and says, yeah, I literally don't know. But yeah. but but I see no reason to you know, jump immediately to the idea that these are inter interdimensional beings from from you know from, uh, 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 from and, the and, Python universe. And being publicly wrong sucks. Yep. Like being publicly wrong is is very annoying and embarrassing. Yeah. Um. And yeah. and people are saying, uh, AKA Nate Silver. I think Nate, if you listen to his podcast, he's very quick to 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 shed that mantle. He he is uncomfortable. Uh, at, at, at being the guru that everybody goes to. Um, uh, mm. Well, okay, sorry. On the podcast, he plays somebody who is very he has, uncomfortable. He's yeah. I, I I think he's a more nuanced person than the caricature. I think when, when when people often say Nate Silver, they sort of are speaking of him as the mascot for all aggregate polling, right? Uh, and and I do think that on on some level, the monkey paw curse for him was that Obama election where he got all 50 states right. Right. Because uh, that was something that I think, uh, uh, A, put him on the map, uh, but also, you know, has put a very unfair burden uh, because, again, he doesn't do the polls. He just, you know, manipulates them. So they all come out, uh, uh, you know, his his uh, sausage strainer. But but yeah, I mean, I. I, I at the end of the day, if you are, if you have expectations on you or you are somebody that should know a thing, if you don't and, or you get caught being on the wrong side of it, man, it's, 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 it's frustrating. And you mix, mix in professional pride well, and, and reputation. And nobody remembers the spectrum that you offer. Like, for example, let's say, let's say this is our you know, uh, the three of us uh, are our 12th time on the local news looking at one of these. And every single time we've said, well, it could be anything from spiders to snakes. Could be anything from spiders to snakes. And it's like, eventually they're like, yeah, but what's your bet? And we're like, yeah, it's probably snakes. And then, and yeah. then, and then we, we hit snakes five in a row. And then, and then again, we say the same thing. It could be anything from spiders to snakes. And it's like, but this time it was spiders. And then all of a sudden we look like chumps. And, and I, I think that's what everybody fears is, is putting themselves out there and then being wrong. And it's like, well, the reason for snakes is, you know, those are tenderly tendrils. Yeah. It's and some people. It's very exciting to think about because I've seen one person online who, you know, very well-respected scientist who's excited about this being new physics, new stuff. And why aren't we looking at this? And I think they're a smart person, but also I don't think they have as smart as they are. I don't think they have a track chasing these things, finding now. from the time you see this on the internet to where it came from. There's a lot of other explanations that come into play. And, and I, and I wish there were terminology where it was easier to express like from a position of authority I wish more people were comfortable saying it is so much fun to imagine or to consider the possibility that this could be blank, 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 and blank. But, but that gets lost in the repeat. And, and I think, um, uh, oh, what's his, what's his name? Uh, Science of the Impossible. And uh, uh, we see him in a bunch of other stuff. He loves to play in the, the, the what if Doctor Who physics was real uh, space, Brian but, Cox. Uh, no, um, um, uh, I'm forgetting his name. Um, Doug Science. Doug Science. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but but the uh, 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 he seems to have a more fun time 
he was the first place where I heard about type one, type two, type three civilizations. And this is a construct, just basically a theoret theoretical st thought experiment. But, but as his star rises, it becomes, you know, believed by more and more people as, as, as fact. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's the, the, Oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean that's the 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 problem is that we, you know, my my warning is always like uh, beware the scientist that's really good at explaining things, because they've spent a lot of time explaining things to the public and maybe not as much researching them. Not to say that there aren't great explainers or great scientists, there are, but you know, sometimes I think, it's I think, like yeah. The only the only addendum I would add to that is uh, beware the strident scientist who's really good at explaining things. Yeah. Like I, I think that's, yes. That's that's where that's where you get into into trouble because I think that there's a lot of uh there's 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 a lot of worth in in just being able to lay out how we understand things today. It gets really dicey when that person also is like, and that's why this is stupid and that's bad. And it's like, oh, okay. That's, it's it's that's a, a little. Strident. By the way, to to clean up my mess, it's it's physics of the impossible, and it's Michio Kaku's that I was thinking of. Uh, okay. uh, he he had like uh, a one one of his thought experiments was okay. Let's take telepathy or telekinesis. Like obviously that's not a real thing, but we can conceive of there is science based ways to read brain waves and move a cursor around. And we also know that in a room, you can have a bunch of animatronics that move things around. So you could combine the two and end up with the effect of somebody who puts his hands to his temples and then just, you know, think of, 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 of you know, various objects and have them seem to float around the room. Yeah. Uh, like, that's fun. That's, that's a really fun thing to do. But then it gets reduced into, yeah, this guy says anything goes. Yeah. Yeah, and I, somebody made the comment, like, we don't have the time to investigate these things, and we have to rely upon experts. Of course, but the difference is, is you just, I'm going to bring up, see, uh, Nate Silver's, one of his most recent tweets was about the lab leak. And Silver is now 60% thinking that it was a lab leak, 40% thinking natural orig origins. Oh, and, and and we're, we, we're talking about coronavirus. Uh, where are you at on that, on that? Uh, the same place I've been for the last year, overwhelmingly lab leak. Yeah. Yeah, and and that's right. something that's become more. Uh, you know, Wall Street Journal just had uh, a, another article about it. Uh, Doctor Fauci over the weekend said that he does not think that it should be ruled out, which is and, a, and to to be clear, this is not an intentional lab leak, but so much as a mishandling of of when we when we say lab leak, lab leak means that it got out of the lab. So right. so beyond that. Uh, uh, motivations i think are are something that even that that's one layer below right the idea that this was a natural mutation that happened in in the wild or at a food market uh this is the idea that either by malice or incompetence this came out of a lab this was this was a a virus in a lab that got out right yeah uh, I, I, I think it was accidental i mean i i because i i would my argument was like for zoonotic, the idea that it was natural, there should be things we should have found by, I would think that we would have found by now we haven't. If it was an intention, and I get my, you know, my, my friends who are very, very conspiracy minded, like, oh yeah, well, who had to benefit by this? I'm like, well, if you are going to leak this as an in, in, intentionally, they did it in the, the stupidest way possible. Yes. Like you, you wouldn't have it all traced back to, you would go to Vietnam or someplace else and start this. So like, it's just, not to say that people are incapable of doing incompetent conspiracies. It's just if you're like, oh, they, that's how clever they are. Well, they weren't clever here. I'm like, no, like, I think it was you know, incompetence. And we've done it, too. And, well, but we've, we've talked about this where there's a history of this. And, and we, we, we've touched on this in the past, but I do think it bears repeating. Uh, the, the, the idea, as I read it, um, uh, I've, I've talked about that three and a half hour special uh, that Sam Harris did, uh, where they talk about, like, there is value to know can a certain disease ever go airborne? And the way you do it mm -hmm. is you keep giving that disease back and forth to whatever creature can have that disease. Mm -hmm. And at some point, it eventually develops the, avail the, the ability to go airborne. And then you keep on wanting to like, well, can a human catch it? So you keep on giving the disease back and forth and eventually it develops the ability to go airborne. Th there is a logical reason and a, and a uh, pro-human reason to do that every step of the way 
it just unfortunately ends with a weaponized uh, uh, version of it that 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 through carelessness can escape from the lab. Yeah, and that's yeah, and and that's the example you gave too of how moving it back and forth would create something that would not have the conventional markers of being a modified virus. And that was the, the thing that drove me nuts because the thing made me super suspicious early on was when the question of a lab leak, the strident scientist like, no, it would show signs. It's like, no, that's a different way that you could show, it wouldn't show signs. Like that, that, yeah. that they are so quick to judge that. I'm like, they're not even considering the hypothesis because something about it's so offensive to them. And that mindset is scary to me. Um, and so a lot of things and, and like, yeah, like we can get into a debate of what qualifies as gain of function or whatever, but it's not going to go anywhere. Um, because scientists can't agree on what gain of function is in the, under thread here in the, our chat about what is, what is it? And I, I, I think directionally we're all correct. Like the virus developed new ability. I, yeah. <laughs> here's, perhaps. here's all, all, all I'll say about this is, uh, uh, in, in many ways, I'm happy with where we're at now. Like all I really wanted with the lab leak thing is for us to to take it seriously and and to look into it mostly because I think that there are people that have the need to answer questions that have not answered questions yet. And what I would like to do is just keep popular opinion on the side of, hey, some people should answer some questions. Uh, but beyond that, it's like, yeah, it 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 seems to me like it like it's a thing. and and I think that, we are we are in an age now where where I hope the pendulum starts to swing is in the position of willfully saying, I don't know. Here are my thoughts. I got thoughts. Mm -hmm. Um, here's why I think the way that I think, but I don't know. Like I I, I think the, the 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 best thing that we can do is is to say that. And the 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 assumption of I don't know to me is as central to the concept of science as knowing anything is. In fact, it might be more a part of science than, than knowing anything, uh, quote unquote, is that the concept of uh, this can all be shaken up tomorrow if, if I get the right evidence. And we, we're getting speculation. We can see it in our chat like, well, you know who benefited, mm, implying that maybe somebody is involved. Like, listen, the weather channels in Atlanta. Atlanta's on the East Coast. Atlanta sometimes gets hit by hurricanes. You know who benefits every time there's a big hurricane? The weather channel. <laughs> I mean, it's like, you got to be careful of like, yeah, because somebody benefit, like because certain businesses benefit from it, whatever, doesn't mean that there is this gray. And like I said, if it was going to be intentionally leaked and these people who you think are involved are as smart as we believe them to be, this would be the dumbest way in the world to do it. You know who you benefits know, like, from the X Games? Some might say it's ESPN. <laughs> I say it's the EMS because <laughs> they're there for yeah. every broken bone. I had a I had a friend who very conspiracy minded, and you know he he goes the Bill Gates stuff and all this, and I'm like. I said something kind of mean. I'm like, oh, so what you're saying is that, like, how good of a conspiracy if you can unravel this? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think, look, there is a tremendous benefit to our modern internet age where so much is trackable and so much information is available. In many ways, it is the absolute dream of journalists and scientists alike. Mm -hmm. I think that it has given rise to a lot of truly excellent citizen journalists and citizen scientists who can just dip in on one little thing and they can do good work and they can illuminate the conversation but good god does yeah. it does it also just uh, uh bring up a yeah. lot of folks who are like i don't know this kind of looks like one and i'm pretty sure this is two so i'm positive that together they're three may i point out that i have both a webcam and a youtube account anyway i must be right yeah. well and even then it's like I, look, if you're making content i almost give you more of a more of a, a line where it's like all right well then you're trying to do two videos a week because that's your cadence so if you're going to do some dumb stuff i don't think it's good i don't think it's smart i don't think it makes anybody better but at least i can understand the reason like uh, 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 I don't know. Uh, I'm actually reading a, yeah. a, a book right now about conspiracies, but it is it is fascinating. Uh, uh, just and, what a natural phenomenon it is. Yeah, my my speculation is, I think it was a lab leak. I think early on the Chinese government. I think one the way it works from the regional area to whatever there was like there was oh we got a problem and then it bubbled up 
and then I think there was I there may have been decisions to make strategic use of this. There may have been stuff like, you know, the CCP, you know, don't a good crisis go to waste is kind of a philosophy everybody uses. So would that wouldn't surprise me at all because the amount of information we got out of there that was conflicting and contradictory, the stuff the WHO was saying, like kind of like I was like like would it surprise me if all of a sudden this thing was running rampant from Wuhan and China's like, do we want to be the only dealing with this? I had read some stuff that, because uh, I know, uh, uh, maybe, if not last week, at least the past couple of weeks, there was a lot of hubbub of like, of uh, just re- release the patent, release the patent on the vaccine, and that will help mm-hmm. third world countries. And my understanding, or at least to hear Bill Bill Gates's argument against it was, every factory that can make a vaccine is working on making a vaccine right now, and. I guess the new vaccine or the vaccines that are out now for COVID use it was it the, the mRNA then they they use a new technology for delivering so, the vaccine. Some some of them have a new technology, some of them use old technology, but the one thing that's and, universal is they were told before they even started trying, everybody start trying, we're going to buy your vaccines whether they work or not. So all of a sudden there was no need like now all of a sudden it was a prestige battle. And everybody just wanted to make the one that would be most famous for being most effective. Well, well, it, 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 and to, to, to get to the conspiracy side, my my the at least what I have read through this whole open up the patent thing is that it would open it would unlock I guess whatever this R mRNA technology would be to all of the other pharmaceutical companies that haven't either n- nailed it or don't have that technology yet, and this would be some sort of corporate espionage to actually open up the patent because it wouldn't necessarily make any vaccines get made faster, but Hey, all this technology just becomes, uh, the because public because domain the idea, to the, everybody. The idea that MRNA is not simply just a COVID thing, but, but it could be a new way that you could attack all sorts of diseases. It's a right. new paradigm I mean, to attack yeah. it, to, to attack. I mean, it's my understanding that yeah. there, it could be completely, uh, but, but I, I it certainly, uh, I could see from point A to point Z on that. There are a couple couple thoughts there. One is that, it, it, it not worded right potentially, but I mean that the patent is narrowly for the use of mRNA for you know COVID nineteen. I don't think that would allow people to use it for other things, particularly if it's a license or an open license to use it for this application. The point that Gates had made about like remember the Johnson and Johnson we had to throw out like nineteen because the same we were doing for like Pfizer for that. That is, there are limited, there's limited constraints and supplies. It's one of the biggest problems. It's not like you just, guys, new, 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 new mission for scam stuff. Right. We're making vaccines now. <laughs> Bryce, go get the 50 gallon drum. I mean, Hang these on, things let me, are let me really, get a pen. <laughs> yeah, these things are really hard and these things are very hard. And, and you might have other places say, oh, we'll make it too. And it's like, yeah, it might, but we've seen how even in high tech, most sophisticated, you know, facilities, how complicated it can be. So, and I, I do believe that every place that is making vaccine can be making vaccine because if you have another place that can make vaccine, if you're Pfizer or Moderna, then you're going to make a contract with them to produce vaccine. Um, we've had problems in other countries where doses, like if you look like Sinovac, some of the other ones were, that were made, like the Russian one, weren't that good. And there's a lot of variability in some of these places we've been looking in the actual quality of the vaccine. And that's a danger thing is that you know, normally when you go off patent, there's still ways to test and do this. And that's a scary sort of thing, because if somebody starts labeling like just as good as Moderna and starts selling, you know, hundreds of millions of copies, you know, to Kenya and it finds out it doesn't work. And then that's a problem. The yeah. the, the the briefest of hat tips to the fact that uh, here in America, it seems like our new problem is not a lack of availability of vaccines. It's a lack of willingness to take them, which uh, is not something I would, thought I would see in my lifetime. Well, I mean, let's yeah. let's also let's also qualify that. Like, it, there are some places where it's going faster than others, but by and large, even where it's going slow, meaningful elements of of, of the population are getting it, and that will probably be accelerated as we start to see more and more the uh, under sixteen uh, uh, demographic that mm. are 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 getting them over the last few weeks, since that's only been a thing. That's just recently happened. Well, so and, like, and then on top of we, that, we, we are doing good. Like, I, I, I feel like, uh, yes, we should address vaccine hesitancy. Yes, we should talk about it. But it does it does frustrate me when we kind of get into a doom and gloom 
hysterical mode of like mm. like we're like ah oh, we're we're terrible. Look, there is an element that is never going to take it, but there's a lot, and we're actually seeing by the polls. Uh, uh, that there is a breakdown of some vaccine hesitancy, including, and I can't believe it's taken us this long to get to it, a brilliant idea that uh, was first hatched on Twitter by our own co-host, Andrew Maine, which was, I believe if we could even find the tweet that predates all of this, uh, that there should be a bunch of billionaires that get together so there could be a national lottery for vaccinated people only. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah, there are so, a couple of states that are doing these. And indeed, weeks afterward, I'm not saying that Mike DeWine of Ohio, the governor, got it from Andrew Maine. I'm just saying. May, that- May 2nd, Andrew Maine tweeted alternate vaccination pitch, a billion dollar lottery. Just submit your vaccination card to Ender. And that's very similar to what New York is doing with their five million dollars. No, and that, and that one I actually don't even like their one. That their one, their one's bad. Michael oh, Wine yeah. actually has it going on in Ohio. Uh, they're doing as of this Wednesday. Uh, they are going to have a one million dollar lottery if you are vaccinated and have submitted in. So it's not even just automatically. It's a lower a lower pool than the people who have been vaccinated in Ohio. But you have to be vaccinated to do it. Uh, and for the next five Wednesdays, they are going to give away a million dollars. <laughs> that uh, sounds outrageous cool. until you think about the average cost of somebody who is experiencing COVID-19 through end of life treatment. And then all of a sudden you realize like, uh, you're getting off. Cheap. Well, and you think of like a $5 million marketing campaign. And that's, and that's so in Ohio, that's buying in Cincinnati, that's buying in Cleveland, that's buying in Columbus. So it's three major media markets that you already have to buy in. Like that $5 million goes away pretty fast. Right. And, and, and it does so a lot quieter than having like, it's going to be a big deal on Wednesday when they reveal a winner. And then it's going to be a big deal for the next four weeks. And here's the, 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 the big kicker. It's working. 58% week over week differences uh, difference in vaccinations in Ohio because they did the, or after the announcement of the lottery. Do, do you think there's any opportunity for pushback? Like, because there's a monetary reason to get vaccinated of that people course. are hiding behind, like, well, that's what they want you to. That's I mean, why of course, I'll never. of course. And it's the same for the people, the Krispy Kreme giving free donuts. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. uh, oh, know. I need to get mine. Are they still doing that? Oh yeah. Every day, every day you get a every free donut. Day. Every single day. Just show up with that card. You get a free donut. <laughs> Somebody got very happy. Oh, shoot. Bryce shoot. just got a raise. <laughs> 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 Um, uh, so, just, so is is um, uh, we try not to get too political here, but we we touched on it briefly during lunch. Um, I guess I guess last week word came out that that despite I'm using air quotes liberally here, everybody who's listening by audio liberally uh, uh, that, uh, that 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 despite the quote unquote irresponsible complete opening of Texas to everything, it looks like like. Nothing but but business as usual, and no more people are dying, and and it seems to have been a good idea. Have you guys read this? I've uh, not heard the everything's all swell. No, <laughs> uh, uh, look at him. Derek, Derek Thompson of the Atlantic wrote a thing uh, uh, about basically the the uh, the, the, the doomsayers uh, to Governor Abbott lifting the mask mandate and uh, uh, saying we're a hundred percent business as usual. Yeah, that that has not. Uh, uh, happen and now as we are watching mask mandates and and restrictions being lifted in in uh, blue states that have been tighter in their restrictions up till now, uh, you know that is something that uh, uh, that should be studied that should be understood and there's a lot of uh, reasons why that that he details I think very well. Derek Thompson has actually been a really good writer on on COVID stuff. Uh, if if you if you enjoy this tenor of conversation, I think he's been pretty good about it. Uh, for the record, I would I like, not I, have I, placed a bet on this. Like like yeah. if a year if, if if two weeks ago I was told this was coming, I would not have participated I- at all. I mean, but, I think it. I, I don't think it's it would be strange to say that America's vaccine rollout has been shockingly fast. Yes. Like and and sometimes to the detriment of other countries. I'm interrupt. But... I've been trying to get okay. in the last. You guys are in the same room, so I never get to speak in okay. because of the delay. All you. I've been trying. Go to... ahead. My Go second ahead. point about patents. My second point about patents. I keep trying, and it's like ah. Okay. Go ahead. Um, Go ahead. Go ahead. Don't worry about it. Go ahead. We are doing it now, Bryce. Um, 
my second point about patents is this. If we decide to break patents, the problem is, let's say next year or we get, you know, year after we get, we've got COVID-23. And if you are a pharmaceutical company and you lost money or barely made even, and you look at what AstraZeneca went through, you know, with their, like the Europe and yes, no, whatever happens. If you go through this process where all of a sudden you don't make as much money as you could have, you face other problems, how eager are you if there's a, God forbid, another pandemic to say, let's put every effort into this. What happened last time? Oh, well, they took our patent. And people right now go, we got to get the patent. We, we got to do this because it's, you know, it's the moral thing to do. Maybe, maybe. But if you create, we've had this problem before where we were doing, we had really advances in biotech research and like there was the gene patenting, which scared people. And then we made that, we banned that. We banned the ability to like patent genes back in 2000. And then you crushed all these biotech companies. You crushed, you know, billions of dollars investment in biotech. And now we're at a point where those patents would have expired anyways, and maybe we would have had more cures and stuff. So that's the trade-off. You've got to think of any time you say, get rid of a patent or, or, you know, open up a patent, you've got to have compensation as part of that. You've got to make sure that the net on those people want to do it. Yeah, okay, the, uh, because uh, from a pure game theory point of view, what it does is it shifts uh, the best player of the game is not the one who actually bothers to invest billions of dollars to find out how to cure a thing. It's the one who just sits and watches until somebody else does it and then just makes the move right after them so that they hope that that they're going to get away with not having to pay any kind of patent licensing fees or what have you. There's a great chart. And to uh, Bryce, your point about as far as like, you know, the vaccination rates and where things are going like, yeah, we don't we don't we don't want to start high five on ourselves all of a sudden and find out that there's some new crazy variation variant that, you know, the, the vaccines don't work with. And that's part of the reason why health officials are trying to be cautious is because there is that unknown and the, and the, the cynics are like, ah, like, and I, I think like, I, I, I bought masks in January, but I also thought that we were stupid about telling people to, not, to wear masks outdoors, you know, like yeah. I have the vaccine, but I'm skeptical of the experts. You can have, you can have complex opinions on all these things. If you switch it to Bryce, go to fully dosed up in the top there. Um, uh, uh, the uh, top of the chart on to the right. People vaccinated, which sees where it says people vaccinated. Ooh, people vaccinated. Oh, no, no, uh, Bryce, go up, 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 mouser up. Yeah, there up, you go. Up, up, the... People fully down. It's called down, it a down. mouser. It should be a mouser, not a cursor. Okay, so you've got yeah, Israel, which cursing. is a population of like 7 million, Bahrain, small, Chile's got like 19 million. United States is 340 million people. We have the fourth highest rate of fully vaccinated people in the world. Look at the other Western countries. Yeah. We're dusting them. We race for pants. And it's sad. Yeah. And I mean, it, and it's tragically too. That's the yeah. thing is that, is that we, not to say that, hey, we need, we're, you know, we won that game and we should be high fiving ourselves for beating COVID, which I don't think that's the case. Mm -hmm. But when we criticize ourselves, we also got to compliment ourselves and say, hey, we somehow managed to do a way better job than everybody else. And well, and, and, uh, uh, to, to, to hear my Canadian friends' accounts on it, the, that is, uh, in in at least not uh, I don't know that is in part to the mm, ruthlessness of the United States in securing shots I I suppose well uh, that's their explanation for it but there was a little thing called Project Warp Speed there was this effort we were the first ones to start buying large amounts of of yeah we, our ruthlessness of saying we'll pay for vaccines before anybody even thought we could have a vaccine yeah you know mm -hmm. and that that's you, the, we nobody wants to give credit where credits due but we early on said hey. Let's put a ton of money into a vaccine. Let's try to get this done sooner. And every, you know, remember a year ago that the idea we was laughed at that we would have people we'd be at this point by now. That was ridiculed. The experts ridiculed that that was even possible. But as we've seen World War II, other eras when the industrial machine of the United States takes a focus on something, yeah. stuff happens. And so, uh, you know, and and you know, if if anything, I do think that there have. Vaccine diplomacy is something that is a very tricky subject right now, uh, uh, including to Canada, um, because the administration, I think, rightly has a very uh, complicated problem on their hands where they would like to be giving vaccines in our stockpile away, specifically for some of the shots that aren't even approved here, like AstraZeneca. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but... 
you also never want to be in a situation where any American who wants a vaccine doesn't isn't able to get one at this point, right? Like you 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 need to take care of the home front first. So, uh, uh, it, it's it's it, it, a complicated situation. I think if there is a a ding, you could say to America is that we also then did a second wave. The, the Biden administration also secured more vaccines on top of what we had already purchased. I think that you could make an argument to say uh, um, maybe the AstraZeneca shot should have been approved here earlier and, and we wouldn't be relying on just Pfizer and Moderna as heavily as we are. I, uh, my, my opinions on the Johnson & Johnson shot are kind of well-known. I think that the pause was disastrous and stupid, but uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot. There's a lot going on. And at the end what? of the day... Uh, the, the the bureaucracy aside, the fact that we have these raw numbers here is, I think, a, a, a miracle. It is it is an awesome sign, and we should be we should be happy mm. that we that we got to this point, and we should and, hope to go further. And and on the diplomacy side, too, like I mean, I certainly think that bringing everybody together was problematic and challenging. But like Canada side, Canada did not want to order its vaccines in the U.S. It decided to order from Europe because they were afraid because of our America First vaccine policy, they wouldn't be able to get them from us. So they said, "No, we'll go to these European manufacturers and we're going to buy doses from them." Well, the European manufacturers have had issues and have been slow to be able to produce these things, and partially because there wasn't, I think, that initial investment and push like we had here. You know, we were able to, we, we limited a risk for a lot of companies here to be able to develop vaccine. Europe was hesitant to do that. Yeah. And I think that's part of the problem. It's like, we need this now. Okay, we help us out. No, you got to give this to us. And it's like, well, okay. So it's complicated. And, and, and I'm not here like, oh, this person's right or wrong. But I do think that if you want a thing, uh, make it better early on. This is my 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 thing, and this was about our initial rollout here. This is about international uh, uh, supply chains. Run the scenario where the life saving shot to the pandemic is doled out across the world a billion times, and a billion times someone's gonna be really, really, really mad, and probably have a reason to be. Like, there's no way that this goes out in any kind of order where everybody is perfectly fine with their position in line to get the life-saving vaccine shot. Yeah. Now, where everybody is happy is at patreon.com slash weird things. Patreon.com slash weird things. Hold on, this is the first I'm hearing about this. Yeah. Hey, Patreon, what, uh, explain to me. Patreon, Brian, it's mm. a website wherein mm. you can support creators who are going out of their way to make... Yeah, but, but 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 the way you support them is yeah. by using their coupon codes to buy other like mattresses no, and whatnot. No, 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 no mattresses, what? Brian. We we don't sleep. None of us. None of us sleep. No, oh, I believe that. Uh, but uh, uh, you can pay us. We do. We do. The only way we sleep is not on mattresses, but on piles of money. That you give us at patreon.com slash weird thing. I mean, because I've had this thought, like what I really wish is I could just pledge a certain amount per episode and yep. that you guys could make money while you sleep and that mm -hmm. we can keep weird things on the air. Indeed. And you can do that at one place in one place only patreon.com slash weird things. Patrons get early access to our after things podcast where we break down what it's like to be an independent creator, including all the projects that we have uh, in the works ourselves. Thank you. Except for oh, that one. Except for that the one. The one that I will eventually uh, stop uh, cattle prodding Brian <laughs> under the table uh, so he stays in line and doesn't talk about. One day, the cattle prod All will go one. away and he will be able to run free through the, through the meadow. <laughs> you know who's running free through the meadows? Well, actually, the airport runways in South Florida. Uh, oh, it's got to be an animal of some sort. Florida man. Monkeys! Yes! Monkeys! Yes! So, for a number of years where we grew up, there have been you know, sightings of monkeys near the airport, near this, uh, the city of Dania, and there was a lot of speculation about where do they come from. I once went on an expedition to go find them and found a giant submarine, which is a whole other story. <laughs> but uh, some researchers said, you know what? Let's. Where did these monkeys come from? Where did they come from? And they uh, basically, um, there's a whole like parking lot there where you can see these things from a time. And then finally, some researchers from Florida Atlantic Univers University said they saw all they pushed it in the journal Primates, by the way, which uh, my goal is to be, you know, get the cover 
feature for primates. <laughs> and they said, uh, Chlorobetus sibius monkeys have survived for decades in a novel environment, South Florida. We traced the monkeys to an escape from the Dania chimpanzee farm in 1948. Apparently there was a chimpanzee farm there. What? And the facility imported primates for medical purposes. So uh, these are adorable. And do you know what it was that gave them a when they started looking at things? That, sorry, that Can you say that again, light? Andrew? You, you're cutting in and out right now for us. Uh, what feature, what, what was a signifier? species of monkey uh i i i'm just guessing that drug dealers had them that's 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 all i that's my answer is drug drug dealers no i mean i'm gonna give you uh sorry andrew you're you, it's it's it we're, we're you're you're cutting out and it's hard for us to to tell what you're even trying to say a little bit sorry um do you mind just trying one more time for me asking asking that same question yeah, let me see if there's something I can do here. What feature? Yes. What feature? Yeah. What feature would what, what's one of the standout features about these monkeys that makes them discernible? A crescent moon on the right cheek. The fact that they're dealing drugs <laughs> at below market rates. No, I mean, uh, uh, I would say probably some uh, uh, facial. Uh, coloration see, maybe it's, it's either noses or butts it's always it's noses, always or, noses butts. or butts it's uh pink noses blue butts blue noses red butts blue but not a blue butt uh-oh uh-oh blue hands blue tails blue please, eyes please old blue be, eyes please don't be a ding dong is it a ding dong blue nipples not not the ding dong uh blue 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 the, test is it fellas yeah, the oh <laughs> no Balls. Good job, <laughs> oh. So it was drug dealers. Yeah, oh, and somebody said Florida them, monkey add special. Them, add them to the proud, the proud list of Broward blue balls. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, that's great. So somebody said they're Florida monkeys, so it's facial tattoos. Actually, it's the neck tattoos. Yeah, exactly. The neck tattoos so, so, so is uh, uh, we're no closer to knowing how they made it. Here, I mean, I assume I don't know. Some of them can swim across Cuba. No, no, no. They were saying that there was a Dania monkey. There's a farm. farm. Oh, that's right. That's right. So, yeah, yeah. so yeah. at some point, probably right by the high lie, they were playing high lie. Yeah, they the world's uh, fastest. No, game. that that I'm sure that was like a lit thing to do in the 40s. Is go down to the monkey farm during the day, and then at night, you know, traipse over to the high lie and uh, have yourself a time. It's a, the number of monkey farms and things like that are kind of surprising or because I remember where the production office was for uh, the TV show that was near the uh, was it monkey Island. And I thought that was a joke and it turned out it was actually a place in California it was like this oh, yeah. big Island full of monkeys. And so what happened to the monk, the monkey entrepreneurs? Well, the also, 30s I mean, forties, you know, Dania in the forties, like I was joking about the highlight thing, but I don't even think the highlight was was, was built by then. Uh, uh, Dany in the forties was basically rural land. You know, they, they, it, you know, South Florida really was only, you know, developed developed. At, at, you know, even that area through the you know fifties, sixties, and seventies. You know, it's just where are all the monkey entrepreneurs? Exactly. What is there? Like I mean, they're probably uh, you know developing vaccines right now. <laughs> yeah. I just want to know like That's where all the monkeys like a, went. <laughs> were there like venture capitalist firms in the 30s and 40s? And like, what I want to do is I want to get a bunch of monkeys. I mean, you already have my money, sir. <laughs> There's <laughs> got it. Yeah, there, there had to be some guy in New York that you know, whatever somebody was like, all right, I got an idea. It's gonna be monkeys. Like, if it's monkey related, you gotta go see Mr. Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, a version of the graduate he's like one word for your son monkeys <laughs> <laughs> they're like the, the like paul graham has his startup like you know blogs and stuff there would be like the telegram about like monkeys are the future you know how about these rhesus monkeys you know i think there's a lot of opportunity there <laughs> yeah. buy rhesus Le sell silverbacks they're too much Ooh. The advantage of a lemur, it only takes one lemur to fill up a large space. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> so, uh, congrats to China. I know we spent some time like 
We'll get past the whole virus thing and now move on to the Chinese space program. You know, they landed their, uh They had a soft landing on Mars, which is extremely rare to do. And now they have the rover. They're the second country ever to deploy a rover on Mars. So they, and they're they getting are, are some they, photos back. Yeah, I, they, yeah they, they're actually spitting back pictures now. Yes. I, I, I did see a bit of chatter and, and I'm hoping that, that, it, that, that uh, one of us can dispel it, but uh, on, on the Reddits, there was a lot of chatter about how much was borrowed ideas from the U.S. program, which, I mean, on the one hand, if you see something that works, why wouldn't you do what works? But also, China has a reputation for not uh, exactly respecting copyright law. I, I, uh, uh, have you heard any of the, the bugaboo about this? And is, uh, do you have anything to chime in on? Considering our entire Redstone program was captured Nazi V2 rockets, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, it's it's not a like you go. Ah, oh, I mean, like the, a, a large smash cut to the three of us sinners tossing stones in our hands. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, sure. And but I think that like if it works, like I said, if it works, it works. And the the Chinese, a lot of the Chinese tech is actually variations. Of, it's interesting because like uh, like they have the Chinese space station. If you look at the shape, it looks kind of like a bottle where it's thick on one and gets narrower on the other end, which is the design they bought from the Russians, which was actually a Soviet design, which was the first Soviet commercial space station, but was actually a military design. And that still has this weird shape. And we don't quite know, was this because of the military fairing they used? But anyhow, there's a lot of, lot of their stuff is soviet not even russian but like soviet sort of hardware that made its way in there um and yeah do they you know use stuff that we've done perhaps but there's it is so much back and forth i i'm hesitant to go like you know like remember the the soviet you know the space shuttle the buran from the design was like very much absolutely looked like the space shuttle but never took pi astronauts, but it had it could fly itself completely. It could do autonomous flight, did one autonomous flight, flew up, came back, and landed. Second, liquid-fueled uh, so, uh, side boosters, where we were using solid. I think the liquid-fueled were smarter, better you know, innovation. And the Soviets had had really great innovation. They had Korolev, who was a brilliant, brilliant rocket engineer who, you know, responsible for so much of what they did there. So uh, I would say that uh, if you want to point at criticism, like, yeah, like, I don't know that they've innovated much beyond what was done before. And I don't know that they've, they've plussed it up with anything else. Um, and I could be mistaken. And I think that I would love for them to be more open. Like we are, where we televise our launches, tell people what we're launching in advance. So, yeah. Uh, but you know. more people on Mars is better. And, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, congratulations to the Chinese space agency for, uh, for, for getting something up there. Cause that's, that's hard to do, you know, not yeah. uh, a pretty short list. Yeah. Uh, one more kind of cool thing. Did you see Google I.O. had their announcement last week? They showed a lot of cool stuff off. Did you see, uh, let me, let's see if I can load this here. Starline. Um, it's Starlight from the boys. <laughs> this is a, um, pulling up the, uh, Google had some pretty cool announcements there, different stuff, a lot of a lot of AI stuff. They're building a whole quantum AI lab in Santa Barbara, which is looks pretty cool. Project Starline, yeah. So look at Google Project Starline. I want to get your take on this. Okay. And the idea is that uh, it's a telepresence project that's been in work. This is pre, you know, been in work for several years now. And then when you see the videos of this, what they're doing is ostensibly. Two people are talking, and they're using mapping, like they're using a, a 4K display with like a lenticular screen. They're using 3D projection, I and mean, they're using like 3D modeling and all this. Oh. So notice as the camera moves, they say it feels like you're talking, the person is like really there. So, so this is using a lot of just smart, stuff that uh, by, by the way that our eye processes the difference between a flat picture and a real person uh and so you take things like you've seen on facebook with those 3d photos where it kind of like moves a little bit as you are 
uh, uh, scrolling up and down. Right. As you're moving your phone, so similarly, uh, it would take advantage of the parallax. So, like, as you shift left and right. Yeah. Uh, you, I, I assume you wouldn't get the stereoscopic vision, but, but, but you, I would you, imagine you, you, you do, you what? do. The, 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 well, it's a lenticular display. So oh, remember, wow. lenticular display that goes over it, so you get a three D effect. So the idea is you, you see I'm surprised stereoscopic they're not just doing eye tracking. Well, they might be doing a lot of things. Just yeah, notice, yeah. like, there's a lot of tech there. Oh yeah, they're kind of in a big booth, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So, and, yeah. And my, my friend Bram Adams says, "Oh, Google recreated prison." I mean, I mean it, it does it does uh, uh that that did not go unnoticed uh but yes and <laughs> and and uh you are able to to have i think uh a, a a richer conversation which as much as the pandemic has allowed us to understand that business can get done via zoom uh and and via telepresence i think we can all agree it is not the same as being in person connecting with your family over FaceTime and, and Skype and zoom is not the same as being in the same room as, as people. And, uh, uh, this brings you a little bit closer. It, it, it makes mm -hmm. your brain think a little bit more like even watching the, uh, uh, watching the, the video. And, and obviously this is a demo. So, uh, uh and, and Lord knows how much, that room was set up and, and loaded to the gills with whatever tech they had to put in there. But it's a cool idea. I mean, I don't know, Andrew, like, where does this, there, there's always the, the, the difference between what, what used to be the kind of Microsoft and Apple philosophies where Microsoft would very often show these cool concepty sort of uh, uh, things. And, and Apple, you know, Steve Jobs was famous for saying, you know, concept cars are awful because it just, makes you warps your your idea of what the actual car that we can produce is going to look like uh wh where do you think this falls on on the line of like tech that is really cool versus this is a concept that we might not ever see applied in our daily lives sometimes in things like this you see researchers pursue one way of trying to accomplish a thing and they spend several years perfecting it but meanwhile you get a more efficient way to do it and this as you saw like in the demo they show the 3d model it makes of the person periodically theoretically because it maps it onto there there's a lot going on there but like we're getting really really good algorithms now for uh simulating like taking 2d images having a having an ai extract a 3d image from it and so there might be when you computationally when things get faster there might be a simpler way to do it and you look at the amount of data that you have in your iphone now you've got we got lidar on our phones we have lidar and i and so the, there's the one is the capture method choose the display like you know brian i think you mentioned like with just eye tracking alone you can do a lot to create the sort of the illusion of something and then with the lenticular display like i looked at all the tech here i'm like i don't i'm like i'm going i don't know if it's really that hard to replicate this um somebody says meanwhile apple apple will copy it i guarantee if you go look at apple patents you're going to see stuff like this already there like apple put lidar into phones they put lidar into yeah. phones because clearly they're thinking about like i've showed the demo before Remember the thing I showed you when you do the using the face scanner and how I could turn my face to the side, yeah, because it's capturing that data there. So that's already in there. That's already in their products. Is a lot of the rudimentary ability to do stuff like this. The the one thing that I'm surprised that they didn't feature, which I feel like is going to be the killer aspect of this, is group meetings. Uh, uh, the uh, the Chinese team meets together with the Australian team. And then, you know, there's four of them over here, four of them over here. And that's that I suspect that's a temporary technical limit limitation. Whereas like the intimacy, they're presenting this as an intimacy based thing, but I have to feel like that's going to be the realm of, 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 um, uh, yeah, you know, VR goggles that represent your face and, and, and some kind of robot fingers that rub your back for somebody who, well, you, who you have an affection for. Well, on that note, uh, uh snap released last week, uh, their new version of the spectacles, which they're testing which naturally now have little augmented reality displays in there. And what I thought was cool, what they did was they were very open about it. When you go click through for the demo, you see it's only a little postage size stamp display in the middle of the glasses, um, which is the big hurdle, going to be the big hurdle. But 
yeah, we we know the direction we're going to. Yeah, click on learn more and you'll see uh, that we know the direction that we're moving into with this stuff. And we can, I don't think we have any trouble figuring out like on a l broadly what things will be like in 10 years. Yeah. So we're looking at the. Uh, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, all these things sort of uh, coming together mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 you know, the, the, the tech catching up to the ideas, but I think we're, we're, we're at a, we're at a very exciting inflection point because a lot of things that I think we really wanted to do really like even like 10 years ago uh, is are, are now computationally, I think a little bit more feasible uh, uh, to make it like an actual thing that we interact with, including stuff like, like Oculus, you know, like yeah. that's, that's something that we've, we've desperately wanted a, a just strap it on and rock and roll VR solution. And now it exists. Yeah, that was like when uh, the you know we're excited like when Hololens was first announced, like when Google Glass first came out, it looked like AR and like oh, and then they're like no, it's a little thing in the corner, like it's dumb. And then Hololens, like finally we have this. Well, it's a little postage stamp in the middle of the display. Yeah. Like we we know what we want, and the technology takes a while to get there. It's not like you know you just yell at somebody, your engineers, like bigger, more now. Like yeah. oh, you wanted a full display FOV. Oh, okay, I had that on the shelf here. I didn't realize you wanted that. <laughs> I kind of like what they so. show in, in, I mean, this is not even a demo video. This is a, a scroll on their website, but I do kind of like the idea that you might have AR stuff in part of your glasses, but like this photo is still wide angle and, but, but you have a little thing where you've taken the photo and now you've got contextual menus and stuff. Like, I, I think, I think that's a smart starting place, um, uh, have, which have you which seems more like adjusting to reality than the Google Lens initial yeah. ha demo video. Did. Have you played with the Clips app in the new iPhone? Not the new version, no. Oh, so it's sick, okay? Because what this does, let me pull this up here, is so Clips is Apple's sort of like, you have a, you have this, I can go in here and I can click on, I can do a thing that says start scan. Mm -hmm. um, if I start scan, okay, and I start to move. I'm going to show this in a second. I'm going to move my phone around. So he's kind of, he's kind of scanning his room, kind of like yeah. When, like, when you open the the compass and you got to, okay. So he's three D scanned it. Wow. Okay. It's scanning my room, and you see it's all of a sudden it's created three D points entirely wow. around the room. Wow. And and so now it notice it includes me because it figures out that's a person. That's what's sort of amazing. So if I do effects. Mm -hmm. so look what happens to everything else so now it looks like andrew's room is pulsing with disco light except for him because it even recognizes that he's there and it does the yeah. geometry of his room oh that's great wow oh wow and it yeah even, the it, lights it even... are tracing along the yeah yeah, yeah tracing along the floor but it's even also showing up a little bit on your on your shoulder as if it would it would uh, react to you that's fascinating that's cool yeah, because if you think of what's going on there, we're watching like we're watching these lasers go along the walls and surfaces there. Um, there's a uh, the disco one. Look at the floor. That's on the side. Yeah. Oh yeah. wow! And it's just on the floor, and it looks good too. Wow. Yeah. So that's you know that was just their little demo they put there. So this are it mapped my room. Like we did this while we're talking. I yeah. mapped my office right here. And all of a sudden, it started projecting these lights and stuff on there. The occlusion for there is not perfect, but it's pretty damn good. So you're able to do lots in front of it. So that that's the really tricky part. Remember, like, you know, when Magic Leap had their demo, we years ago, like, oh, I looked at an elephant in my hand. And I'm like, yeah, it's projecting it in front of it. That's easy. Show me the elephant walking behind your fingers, and that's impressive. Yeah. So, uh, but that's the, that occlusion technology, the ability to say, this is a person in the foreground and no green screen or anything. It's incredible. So gentlemen. Yes. Ready for picks. Oh yeah. Yo, what I you got? Pick. I got a pick. Uh, so dark side of the ring. It is a, uh, a series on vice that uh, goes into stories about professional wrestling. Uh, if you are not a professional wrestling fan, I do think this is something that you can enjoy because it is mostly faced, you know, talking about the human uh, parts of these stories. But in their third season, they told my favorite 
wrestling story of all time, and that is the story of Collision in Korea. I'm going to lay it out because this is a cinematically amazing story. A bunch of wrestlers from America and Japan in the 90s. So imagine everything of like every bit of the the gold gym cut off t-shirts and zubaz pants mullets a uh, uh, level of, uh, uh, of, of of professional wrestling they go on a diplomatic mission of peace to north korea to pyongyang north korea they do two nights at a festival to mark the birthday of kim il sung the the dearly departed dear leader and uh, it is as much of a culture clash as you could possibly imagine. Basically think of the hangover meets Argo where all these guys who are just kind of used to going, wrestling, working out and cheating on their wives wind up in Pyongyang, have all of their passports taken. They have no idea how to interact with anybody. They're being watched constantly. Uh, uh, two of them wind up getting into a fight and almost uh, uh, killing each other. It's uh, a great story, and it is covered in Dark Side of the Ring, which uh, uh, is now airing on Vice uh, Season 3. But you can go in. I watched it on on iTunes. But Collision in Korea, an amazing, an amazing story. Also, Muhammad Ali is there. <laughs> of course he is. Yeah. Uh, so I, uh, I got one. Um, we, we've talked about a friend of the show, uh, Captain Disillusion, who normally, uh, invests his special effects expertise to, uh, debunking fake videos, but, um, he's branching out and sort of giving a character to him outside of his Captain Disillusion makeup. So what he does is he puts intern Allen, AKA himself without the captain dissolution makeup in charge of, you know, doing an episode. He's like, I don't know what to talk about. He's like, uh, you know, Hey, just uh, have a flight of fancy. I'm sure you'll navigate some way to something to talk about. And he goes fly navigate and then proceeds to do 45 amazing minutes, defunct land style, breaking down all of the VFX genius that went into a uh, uh, flight of the navigator. Oh, wow. And, and, and at one point he talks about like, uh, okay, this effect, this fact, that effect. Uh, and it was all CG, right? Nope. Only 15 seconds of this was CG. Everything else was practical. And we know it because here are the pieces of it. Like dude has been collecting all of this stuff. Oh, wow. It is, it is, it is an awesome departure from what you would expect from the captain disillusion channel. And it's so filled with genuine passion and enthusiasm. Uh, highly recommended. It's almost a 40 minute watch. I think you'll like it a lot. You're the second person to bring this up. Um, I just watched Fly to Navigator like a few weeks ago and then watched, dug into behind the scenes stuff of all that because partially it's nostalgic because I was around that age growing up in South Florida at that time. And I look at that like, oh, I know that bridge. It's a little Solace Bridge. And you kind of like, you look at all those locations, but like, yeah, there's cool stuff. You're like, you look at the steps illusion right there where he walks up these floating steps and it's just, it's basically like a magic trick the way they did that. So many clever things were done in that movie. Uh, it's um, really, really good. And and it's it's one thing you can't fake in these kind of think pieces is the genuine passion. And and Alan really has it. It's it's really adorable and sweet. Uh, I, I highly recommend it. Yes. And uh, notable. Do you remember the movie? Uh, oh, yeah. 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 I, I, I including who played the uh, the puppet Max uh, one Paul Rubens. Yeah, and it was a first big uh, role for one Sarah Jessica Parker. That's right. That's right. As a matter of fact, he actually wraps up the 40-minute uh, piece with talking about how, like, uh, well, it seems like you got this thread that was left undone. And, you know, if anybody, you know, wanted somebody who deeply loved all of this stuff and knew all the back lore and maybe had thought of an entire story, they could go back and Sarah Jessica Parker could reprise her role as an old mm -hmm. woman. And then it could be about this other person who goes to the future and mm -hmm. has a similar experience. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's great. Cool. Uh, let me switch cameras here. Uh, oh, uh -oh. Bryce, do you have a pick? Uh, yeah, I do. I'm yeah, uh, I'll, do, I'll do that while you're getting your, your camera situated, it looks like. Uh, I've got a, a quick pick. This is uh, a relatively new to, to uh, Netflix. It's an original feature film called Stowaway. Uh, we featured this as an opening to Cord Killers, uh, uh, I don't know, a month or so ago. But basically a, a three-man mission to Mars. 
uh, uh, about 12 hours in, it turns out they find out that they got a fourth person on the ship. Uh, a, a launch engineer has a concussion and gets stuck in the ship uh, after it after it launches on its way to Mars. And uh, uh oh, some stuff is broken, and now they have to manage resources and figure out: Are they going to Mars? Are they going back home? Uh, it's it's pretty dramatic. It's kind of uh, um, a conceptual. Right? I think it's very strong on its concept. What happens if you have too many people and not enough oxygen? Um, and got, uh, Daniel Day Kim. Daniel Day it? Kim, uh, Tony Collette, Anna Kendrick, and Shamier Anderson. Uh, oh. uh, it's 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 two hours. It's a little it's a little long. Um, but what Netflix thing isn't? Uh, but I think it's pretty good, and and I think it does a good job of trying to be kind of a small conceptual piece uh, without uh, uh, I don't know without going too big or too I, hokey on it. I hope this isn't a backhanded compliment, but it was so much better than I dared hope. Like I went into it like, Oh, wait. oh you saw it. Like, Oh yeah. Yeah. I went into it thinking like, I like the Martian. I'll watch another Netflix budget version of the Mar- Martian. And mm-hmm. then by the end I was just like, uh, I, I was really moved. I, I yeah. really like, um, it's, it's, you know, it's, uh, everything takes place on the ship. Uh, you got, uh, so, so it's a bit like moon in that regard. Yeah. Uh, you get some voices off the ship, but that's about it. Everything else is people dealing with like, wow, scarce resources. Only the four of us. What do we do? How is this going to play out? And, uh, and I think it does a good job of I, I think coming so. up with an answer. On yeah, that. yeah, I, yeah. A, a believable one that, that that I felt. I really felt. I liked it. Yeah. Uh, so that's still uh, uh Scott Manley, who is one of my favorite YouTubers when it comes to all things space. He was a consultant on that. That's right. Oh, that's awesome. And he'll, he'll he'll tell you what he what he what he thought was they got right, and then like and then the Hollywood does the other thing. But, there, uh, there, there, there was uh, uh, I rather enjoyed one big fake out where they're all like, "There's a thing that is very dangerous, and you must avoid the thing because if the thing oh, happens, yes. that's very bad." And then it never. And so it's ever like, happened. okay, well then that's definitely going to happen. Right. And then twice they just go past the thing and it's not a problem. It's not a thing at all. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> it's one of those things where you make, where you wonder, was this supposed to be two and a half hours? Like, <laughs> God, I hope they, because it is, it is a little long. It is a little long, but I think it's pretty good. Yeah. But it's also very so, human. I, I, I didn't mind them taking their time. Andrew? Uh, I, I don't have a pick, but I have more of a, hey, this looks cool and I'm excited to see more of this. Have you seen Demio for the Oculus Quest? Go on. No. D-E-M-E-O. Take a look at this. Imagine a fantasy game where you go around dungeons shooting orcs or whatever monsters and you have spells and all this sort of stuff, right? Go on. But sure. imagine it's done like D&D where you have the option to play with your friends and sit down and look at the table in virtual reality and go watch your characters on. move through there or switch modes. So if you see some video of that price, you can see the this it looks like a such this is the kind of thing i've been thinking that will be really cool when we get this sort of stuff because vr some of the best vr experiences aren't where you're walking around and doing stuff sometimes they're stationary yeah and so you see you've got turn but car i know you guys don't like card based games oh, but what are you doing to me so it kind of looks like um yeah a tabletop game almost XCOMy because you also have the card element to it Mm-hmm. Wow! Oh, but, that looks good yeah, too. But you can you can descend into the board if you'd like. Yes. And At these are oh, so in this trailer they're showing multiple people with Oculus um, quests in Sitting the same around room. The table. Yeah, working around the same virtual table. Is that how this works, Andrew? Yes. You, uh, you or, 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 or or does it? Oh. Or, or can they? Are, are they in different places? And yeah, it just no, feels I, as I, though I, we're yeah, in the no, same no, room. It feels as if we're all. In... You you can be in different places. Yeah, you could do either. Oh yeah. wow, what have you done to yeah. me, Andrew yeah. Maine? What what have, you, what have done? you done to my friendship? What have, you done? what have you done to my friendship to Justin Robert Young? <laughs> I mean, it looks pretty awesome. I it love, does. I love... All right. So wait, is it available now? Yes. Are we getting it? And, We're all getting and it. Right? Yeah, we could get it. And they're gonna also make options for it to work on desktop and other things, so you don't have to use VR to play with it. So you can play with people in different environments. Oh, that's but. Awesome. I love the thinking on this. Just love, love, love the thinking because I think I, it's great. Yeah. I, I, I love, I, I, have, I have long wanted, my number one thing that I've wanted is a co-op turn-based uh, uh, RPG to basically like 
either by myself or with friends uh experience a a kind of like turn based combat fantasy thing instead of everything just being kind of like point and shoot uh so I think this is great Ooh, and there's a single player there's a single player mode oh, oh nice oh yeah we're gonna get this cool. this is gonna happen. Well, I hope yep. you enjoyed the very last episode ever of Weird Things. Brian is shaking. He's literally like, he looks like he's about to pop out of his seat. I, I think, I think, th- I think we've, we may have found this may be the end around for the Beat Saber dead end. Um, Cause that like all new VR games tended to feel like either trying to do shooters based on other stuff. Yeah, the really new cool stuff just is there's rare, but like the idea of like, hey, the, that category of turn based VR. Oh. I mean, because you can and you can start doing cool things where you could sit there and you could you could you could build stacked dungeons and stacked environments and stuff and move well, your and characters that's, and around. And that's the thing is that like I just I was very frustrated with where fantasy stuff in VR was going because you know it's resource intensive. You know that the budgets weren't what they needed to be to build the most immersive AAA gigantic We're, we're, we're not about to have Skyrim in VR. I, eventually, yeah. maybe, but... Yeah. Like, I right think we now, already have Skyrim. Install base oh, yeah, not there. on the Oculus, though. I mean, the, 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 yeah. the install base okay. wasn't there. But it's like, when you look at Final Fantasy 2, it's not a gigantic amount of maps. You're fighting the same guys over and over and over again. And guess what? You loved it. Let's go out there and grind for XP. Like, just give me something that feels cool and turn-based, and 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 so I'm I'm slowly leveling up my character. Oh, this is such a great idea. Yeah. So there you go. Nice. It's been weird. Hey, very good show. Good everybody. job. We did it. That was that we was uh, that was that was a uh, uh, technological. It was fraught. Yeah, but fraught. Th- thank you it for was, it. Was uh, uh, stout, Marvel. stout of character that we all made it through. Uh, well, we uh, uh, pretty good. Uh, we are going to take a minute and get ready for after things today. Yep. And uh, hello, everybody. Alrighty, yeah. Take take your stuff. Take, take yeah. If you need to break too, Andrew or uh, Justin. No, I won't. I'll never leave you. Uh, I'll never leave you hanging. I've been doing um, not attacks. Yes, on Tuesdays, right? Well, no. No. It was on Tuesday a few uh, uh, two uh, weeks ago. About right? three, two or three weeks yeah. ago. Um. But then this, we just did one on Friday. Nice. Because I kind of don't want it. I don't. I don't like doing it on Tuesday because I don't want people to be. Because then you get people who are like, is it just Bryce? Oh yeah. Is so you want Bryce to be a gift? I want it. You I don't. You don't. You don't want. You don't want Bryce to be a boo. You want Bryce to be a yay. <laughs> so if Bryce shows up on a Tuesday, <laughs> boo. Where are the other guys? <laughs> if Bryce shows up on a Friday, it's yay. yay! Bryce is here. <laughs> Uh, but I I like doing not attacks. It's fun. We just get up and we watch YouTube videos or we Hell find yeah. something to do. Um, and so I kind of want to do try to find a way to do a little more of those because those are fun and um, everyone always complains we don't watch videos enough. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I think um, uh, uh, you know uh, I, I I don't know how much you talked about it here, but we talked about it on on uh, night attack. Uh, or ghost attack. Ghost now. attack. Excuse me. Uh, that um, you know, uh, uh, we're in a we're in a transitional phase. Uh, uh, mm. a, a a large part of that is relying on the community and uh, trying to do uh, everything that we can to keep everybody happy while we transition and and become a bigger, better battleship. Uh, and I I love that. Uh, you know, Bryce, you have continued to keep. Keep keep the baby afloat, as uh, as the possum posse would say. Yeah, and it's um, it's uh, it's it's almost a little strange because that's that's what I like. I like doing the streaming and the you know the live producing and whatnot. Um, and so you know over the past year or so, I've tried tried to be more stable with streaming stuff. Yeah. Um, and now it's kind of getting to a point where well, maybe I want to do. Even more than that, right? Like, 
um, which I think is possible. Uh, so I don't know. I want to, I like, I, I want to do more streaming. We have so much good streaming we can do. We've got marbles and the new thing and not attack and all the podcasts. Hell yeah. No, uh, uh streaming is, uh, a good, good time. Dead. It's dead. dead. It's dead. It's, it's it gone. Dead. It's out. Uh, all right, Justin, go, uh, uh, if you need to take a break, now's the time. Unless you need to talk to him, Andrew. God. <laughs> We've we've talked out. Uh, I see says, like... yeah. I see says I've lost so many channel points on those knockoff Beyblades. So I don't know if you saw Andrew. I've been prototyping my new LFG project live on, on. on the channel, um, and it's you know the thing I never expected honestly because I've I told Andrew about this a little while ago. The thing I did not expect about doing. I don't know, trying to come up with a project around doing Beyblades. Um, the thing I didn't expect would was how important it was you got real Beyblades. Like, instead of knockoffs, I got two real ones that came with this arena thing. Um, and uh, like 15 knockoffs for like way cheaper and all of the knockoffs like they don't fit in the launchers very well and they're really light and they break all the time um uh so, so that's i had never seen what a i i a beyblade was one of those things that was like it's like esperanto or <laughs> it's I, something i know it's a thing i mean i know more about esperanto beyblades but like yeah. i'd never seen a beyblade in action until now <laughs> and it's, it's an F it's a fucking top price. It is, it is it is, but there's there's so much complexity because each one is made up of three different piece three different parts which are all customizable and interchangeable and then and then they have names. I had I was doing this a couple weeks ago and someone in the chat showed up who knew he knew what Beyblades were and was like, Oh that's a that's a that's an uh it, an it, arc is this disappointing approval look not registering enough do i need to amplify <laughs> is it because i'm using the facetime not the good camera it was it was it was very it was very i did not expect it there i did not expect the need for authenticity in this project i can't wait for the little ball and rubber band and paddleboard to come back in there with the fancy name <laughs> bing, bing, bing. uh uh but uh so you know still still testing the waters on it still still prototyping but but you know what as like a below minimum viable product like the these two streams have been good we've been able to do little bets on the twitch channel just with twitch points and uh uh, uh i had travis help me out with this last shoot so because the the other tough thing was just doing it by yourself you can't do it by yourself because you have to like load them and they don't like secure in they like half secure so that they can actually come out, which is very difficult to do with two people because you're like, Vroom, and then you gotta put it down, and you gotta, Vroom. yeah. Weird. Yeah. It's weird. It's a weird one. Say again. Uh, hey. I, I was gonna ask if if we had an angle on uh, after after talk, after things. Um, I have a little bit of one, but yeah, we yeah we don't have an email today, but if if we got a little topic, uh, that'll hold us. Just a little topic. Just a little topic. There's a because plenty to go on about that I can't talk about. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Uh, Justin, I, why I, won't you let him talk I'm about that? I'm not controlling thing? anything. I'm just, you know, <laughs> just I, I fell down some stairs. I, just, look, oh my god. I, I opened the door. It's just so dumb. I opened the door. I, just, look. Look, I'm, I'm not, I'm not doing clearly that. two not... sides of the same coin on the exact same page, same goals. <laughs> <laughs> one of one of us just, I compared it to, uh, Brian is the best demolitions expert in the world. And so he just needs his full accompaniment of dynamite to just get to the moment where we need to actually use it. And all Brian wants to do is just be like, just one, just, can I just light one? I just need one stick of dynamite. Just one stick of dynamite. That's all I need. It's just one. It's like, no, 
No sticks of dynamite until we get to the very end. There's just firecrackers. Then you're throwing one stick at a time. One. And then finally, you're like, it's time for the big explosion. Where is the big explosion, Brian? Oh, I don't know. I already blew it all up. That was a lot of fun, though. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, we're, 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 they're drawing it. They're, we're, they're drawing it. All right, you guys want to do after things? Ready. Yeah. All right, Andrew, I'm going to count you in. And I'm gonna give you all. I'm gonna give you a whole bunch of seconds so you can get that thing done. All right. I'm gonna catch you in, Andrew. In three, two. Hello and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Oh, hold on. I had a response. <clears throat> Let me scroll. Thank you, Andrew. And. Join, joining us is Mr. Just, Justin Robert Young. Mm-hmm. Sorry, wait, hold on. I'm just reading this uh, transcription. Uh, apparently, uh, Amazon has some notes on my purchase, but I'm happy to be here as well. Cool. And then, Gosh, uh, pardon me if I get the name wrong, Mr. Uh, Bryce Castillo. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Andrew. I'm so glad to be back on the After Things program. <laughs> wow, man. I ain't never seen, like, we were racing for pinks on that one, man. Smash that subscribe <laughs> button and ring that bell. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm not going to be pleased until that's the end of the State of the Union. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. Oh. Uh, so, uh, a, a thought that I wanted to address is I've been watching this, this Hobbit like behind the scenes. I'm yeah. almost done with all the behind the scenes for all Hobbit movies, which is fascinating. I and assume it takes point... twice as long because you have to watch twice as many frames. <laughs> that was a reference to uh, the high frame rate. Yeah, so, uh, no, no, fine. I got it. It's I, fine. I got it. I was fine. Letting no, I was there. being punished. That's all right. Uh, uh, they, all right. They, no, because I'm thinking like no, you say that because like every time they show a clapboard, you see 48. You see the frame rates on everywhere. <laughs> Remind me because when you watch it at home, it's 24 FPS. You know, converted for whatever in digital, it's like there's no 3D, there's no 48. It's like all of the part of the things that make that production a little bit of a pain in the ass. Uh, are yeah. are the um the behind the scenes a better experience to watch than the movies? <laughs> oh undoubtedly undoubtedly you you appreciate so much more of like it was an enormous effort you know they had three years to prepare for lord of the rings peter jackson once guillermo de toro left they had five months to prepare for the hobbit and this was the finished principal photography on the second film remember when it was going to be two movies yeah finished principal on the second film like you know what? Let's make this a trilogy and put a movie in between these two other movies. Oh, wow. Oh, so the, I didn't realize that they'd filmed the first and third, and then they're like, let's spread out all this smog stuff to so write a story around the all the smog and, stuff. And this stuff is happening. Like, they had, like, you watch this tearful goodbye, the last day is shooting, da-da-da-da-da. A week later, we decided to do a third film to go in between one and two. And then you're like, it's just so, and then you like, cause they have this habit where they give like the stars gifts, but they leave and you watch them like, 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 you know, like Martin Freeman, like go through those like several times, like, Oh, goodbye, Martin. Here's the gift for you. Here's the thing. And you know, the fine. And they're just like, you know, taking like, you know, stuff off like, ah, oh, here's a bunch of Jolly Ranchers from our craft services table. <laughs> you know, not really, but it, 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 it's, it is an amazing, I, I love Peter Jackson, Philippa Boyens, Fran Walsh, that team, everybody who worked on this, I, you get, you get why those movies weren't as endearing as Lord of the Rings. You get the pressure and stuff in there. And I'd say, if, if anything, it does make you appreciate what they had to deal with more. They talk about when they went to do the five armies, um, how 25% of that film is like all CGI. And you see Peter Jackson running around the mocap with this camera with these little white balls on it. So it's being captured so he can look through the viewfinder and see the previs. And he's shooting the battle sequences, looking at it, saying, oh, this is a good angle here. This is a good angle here. Barefoot, of course, as he runs around. 
And then they're like, oh, we, we need we need to get like, you know, orcs getting beat up. And then they have these stunt guys in, in like, you know, mocap suits being yanked by cables into mat into walls and stuff oh and being God. thrown around and stuff. Uh, there's an entire, I don't know if you saw the extended version, but there's an entire like dwarf chariot scene that didn't make it into the theatrical cut that uh, you see them, the actors do it. And then way back in, in after in post, they have all these stunt actors playing a part of the dwarves and they're in mocap. I mean, it's just technically really, really insane. And I guess the point I was trying to make though, was like, you watch this, the watching him shoot on a virtual set, which is what like James Cameron had done on avatar. And then we showed in our last uh, podcast, we were talking about like how, uh, like the background removal technology that like the iPhone has with LIDAR and other, other systems have too. And where is this sort of going? And I, I used to think that, like, if you see some kind of cool tech demo by some researchers do that, like, oh, somebody's going to make this happen. That's often not the case. That's often not the case. If you think there's an opportunity out there in anything, it shouldn't discourage you. Shouldn't come to the conclusion somebody else is doing this. You know, yeah. Justin and Brian both went into fields where other people were doing things. Jason you and there's room for innovation there's room to be creative and stand out well and, and uh, i would go a little bit of a step forward in that when we first started uh bb live show and early nsfw show we thought in our minds that we were doing a poor impression of what leo laporte was doing on this week in tech but what we were actually doing is discovering how rudimentary the uh copyright detection technology was on Twitch and or or Justin.tv or any of those things. Like we we were just playing. It's like, why isn't people why why aren't people just playing all of why are there not VJs playing the most popular viral videos? And nowadays the answer is is because you'll immediately be taken down. But at the time, uh <laughs> there was nobody to do that. There were no yeah. guards at the gates. So so in in thinking that we were behind the curve, we were actually ahead of it. Well, and I think that that was early form and function, and and you've really seen, uh, I mean, from if you were to do like the CGI groundbreakers kind of like Hall of Fame from going from like something that was fully like a uh, CGI early like uh, like like you know uh, Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow or something like that to everything that that uh you know, uh, Peter Jackson had you know, pioneered with Lord of the Rings and then did again with uh, uh, The Hobbit. There is some amazing, amazing work that now is kind of like what used to be groundbreaking CGI then is now kind of budget CGI. You can you can do if you've got enough time and effort and, and sweat equity in it. Uh, and, and the high-end stuff is, you know, if anything, kind of like stagnating. If if you look at some of the reactions to major Hollywood uh, 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 blockbusters and some of the de aging debacles and 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 stuff like that, it's it, it really is a, a fascinating uh, time. Well, and at, at the risk of opening up a door, I'll I'll, I'll I'll open a door ajar, and if you feel like there's something there, then we can pursue it. But but we've had some private conversations about what we want to go into, and I've been a big fan of figuring out what can you do that nobody else can do and uh and and if so do that i would say that 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 was a truth back in the early days of scam school like uh i don't mind going to an actual bar getting real people who are half drunk and teaching them magic tricks and trying to get them to do it back to me yes that's going to be a lot of work it's going to be a lot of effort it's going to be highly there's going to be a lot of footage that we can't use we're going to have to try multiple times but it was that, uh, uh, as Justin put it, the internet smells effort, and as a result, that show did well. Same thing for NSFW. Uh, when we launched that show on the Twit Network, it's like, as far as I know, no other no other show would come out with a missive video of two minutes long pre-produced saying, hey gang, here's the mission. Here's the crazy thing we're going to do tonight. It's well produced. It's got music and you've got six hours to put together your submissions for it. Um, and, and we did it mainly because we were, because we could and we're excited to do it. And I'm not going to say that's always turned out to be the right decision, 
but but in general, like if you can do a thing that other people can't do, that seems to have paid off. And you know, you you brought up an example before the other episode talking about paying a compliment to one YouTube show saying that it was defunct land style. Yeah. And and defunct land for those who don't watch is one of those amazing YouTube channels of a person who says, if if we went to if we went to Travel Channel and we said, hey, we want to do a show that does a deep dive into theme parks and amusement park rides, they would, we'd get a meh, like, what about America's Most? Thing? We'd get some alternate pitch, which might be okay, but not really very good and not as deep. And they would never sort of kind of green light the kind of thing we'd want to do. But then you take the show Defunct Land, which gets over 600,000 views for these 30 and 40 minute episodes that's outpacing shows on cable. Like yeah. that's the big, that's the thing that cables reckoned is that there are YouTubers with way more audience and making, you know, kind of more doing better than they are. And, and, and that's that, the and world that's, we live in. And that's in Nielsen numbers, which we have no idea how, how, how close to reality those, those numbers even are. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing is like, that's kind of the power of going, like doing a deep dive, like do a deep dive. You go a little bit deeper into something and all of a sudden, uh, but the episode from one week ago ha is about a stupid theme park attraction at SeaWorld about a submarine. It's got 678,000 views. Probably more people watch this video than ever rode that theme park attraction. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and that's, that, you know, on, on that note, this is something that I actually, a decision that I made over the last week. Um, so on the politics show, uh, I've, I've kind of had this sort of existential uh, question because the the show was really built in in the last few years for a high news throughput. There was never a question of exactly what I would talk about because I I knew that there were X amount of fires that were there. Very more often, I would find myself not wanting to talk about certain things because I found them to be overblown. That's not the case anymore, and so. As I found myself struggling more and more to find topics, I, I actually went to friend of the show, Andrew Heaton, and I was like, well, what do you like about my show? Like, what, what is something that I should do more of? And he said, deep dives, history. You know, Raise the Dead as a podcast series that I do only comes out maybe once a year, and so I should be carving out more of that element into px3 and so that's what i did on uh, uh starting last week i've i've started just doing a deep dive on fridays into old attack ads and and just kind of looking back in into history and just kind of understanding these things in context uh and giving them the same treatment as i would a, an election just a little slice just basically that that 15 minutes i would spend if i had done a raise the dead on that entire election on that ad I can carve that out and, and put that on, on PX3. And so far, the feedback's been great. It's kind of opened up all these other little avenues of, of people responding to it. And now I can make it more of an organic conversation with the audience. And uh, uh, I'm uh, uh, very, very happy about, uh, about that, that decision. But the, the deep dive, man, it, it is just a, a, a language of our modern internet. And, and when it's done well and you trust the narrator uh boy is it is it powerful there's a we've got seven billion people on the planet right seven billion and growing and my girlfriend she's from india and her friends you know a lot of her friends are in india they live in india right now do you know what her friends are super excited about right now what what like the big thing they're getting excited for no the friends reunion <laughs> that's okay. awesome yeah they they were most of our friends they're in their 20s so this is a show that they've only seen in reruns yeah right but that show is timely for them they love the show they're all excited about this and this is about you know an american show american thing but the beautiful thing about american culture is it is a melting plot and that's why there's a lot of relatability to it and when you start thinking about, ah, oh, I'm going to do this thing, but I, will anybody else be into it? Well, you know, half half that 7 billion people on the planet have access to the internet. Yeah. And, you know, 
somewhere out of a couple billion people, you might be able to scrape a few people that might be into it. And sometimes if you're really into a thing, you look hard to find it. And so that's, it's just, I mean, some things might be too niche, too niche, but it's just the, the, the fact that, you know, I, I've watched her discover like eighties music and do these deep dives into stuff now and watching interviews with people and telling me stuff that I never knew about some of these people. And though, so like culture is, culture is our product. Culture is what we are. And, and it's so transmissible and it goes across boundaries and borders and through time. Uh, and, and there's two angles to approach that as a creator. One is like, okay, what's in me? And the only way to find out what's in you is to get started and, and to find out what you hate. And then, um, um, I, I don't, I don't know how much we want to go deep into, uh, our process for something that I can't name. Uh, but, 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 but it's basically, um, uh, a question is asked, an answer is given, uh, a, a version of a script is written. The script is refused to be read correctly, but instead something else comes out and it gets kicked back and forth. And then there comes this moment that, that both Justin and I, as we put it, hate listen to it, uh, which, which sounds terrible, but I think is the most important thing. That is when a sculptor sculpts, is when they figured out everything that is not the figure of Mercury that is in this, this stone or, or whatever. So, so there's, there's that aspect, but then there's also the aspect of what does the world want? Uh, because you can do all of that work and find out that what you're doing is providing very well a product or a service that the world doesn't want. And you don't get to decide whether or not you deserve a thing because, because you want it. And the only way to find out either of those is to get started. And, and, and you know, we're looping back on one of the classic themes here, which is uh, do do that's yeah. the only way you gather just data just is, go. is, is I mean, just, just get started. And, and the only reason why I know it's a slam dunk that I can go back to old, uh, uh, attack ads and do a history deep dive on them is because I've kind of eaten around the edges of that idea. And I know that when I've done it, the audience has responded and now I can, you know, it took somebody pointing it out to me to be like, Oh, just do that obvious thing that everybody loves when you do it. And I'm like, Oh, Okay, well that makes sense. But I have the knowledge because uh, I've 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 been around that idea, and 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 that's that. God, you only find that out if you are out there just creating and connecting and figuring out what what people want. Because I think that there is a real danger of trying to solve the problem in your head and trying to solve the audience expectation in your head, as opposed to throwing things out there and seeing what people are biting on, seeing what you're good at, what you like making like uh, uh, that to me, the only way to walk is to put one foot in front of the other, instead of writing in your head, this amazing uh, uh, forward uh, uh, calculus of how you would walk. And then you try to take some complicated step and you fall and you're like, well, that sucks. So, so uh, at the risk of begging you to give me the answer that I want to hear, Andrew, uh, my my 17-year-old daughter has a very developed fantasy world and a very developed set of characters that she loves very, very much, and she wants to represent them well. And it leaves her in a state of paralysis because uh, it seems like, to her, the worst thing that she could do is fail to represent those characters well in a way that, that uh, would make them live in other people's minds the way they live in her minds. Uh, meanwhile, uh, I, I suppose growing up in magic, I was fortunate enough to, uh, around the same age, uh, uh she's 17 I would have been 18, 19 when I realized, oh wait, I'm going to have an imaginary conversation with everybody I respect in magic. And I'm going to ask them the question, have you ever had a show that went terribly wrong? And in my imagination, every single one of my heroes would outdo me to, to extreme success talking about like, uh, you know, Penn and Teller saying, yeah, we tried to do a show in the middle of a full on race riot to, uh, to, to, it's like, uh, well, I had fruit thrown at my stage to, it's like, I was physically stabbed during my show. Somebody, somebody robbed me during my show. And, and, um, in my mind, it was like somehow that failure was 
inextricably linked to the success. And it's like, well, I better, I better rack up these failures real fast. What's the fastest way I could rack up these failures? And I, I don't know how to give, uh, ultimately, and now I'm in a position of, of privilege being in my late 40s, uh, I, I want to give my 17-year-old daughter the gift of seeing things that way because it seems to have worked out pretty well so far. But, it, but, but I suspect that there's no way for me to say it in a way that she could hear it. And, and I don't know if you have a different take on that. One, you're probably right on the being it's hard for someone to hear it. Second, there's a problem with all those analogies you get, all those stories you gave. None of them involved the performer being bad. They were all about external things. And when you're talking about your doubt, will I fail? Will I do poorly? Will I, do I not have the skill to do this? And when I talk about writing is that I'm like, to me, it's like, it would have been arrogant for me to assume that the first time I sat down to write a story that it would be good. Because I just, it, there are too many variables. The beautiful thing about writing, unlike performance, is if you got to go do a show Friday, uh, it's booked by Saturday. Yeah, Saturday, you're done. You can't do anything. But if you're like, I have to have a rough draft of my story by Friday. And if it sucks on Friday, it's not going to suck. To, you know, if you if your show sucked on Friday, your magic show sucked on Friday, it'll suck on Saturday on that show you did will suck forever, eternity, because you can't go back in time. You write a story, you start somewhere and you can improve it. If you've underst if you see, I think that the strongest signal you can show is to say, hey, just write something. And then we're going to go through this and I'm going to teach you how to make it better because I want you to know everything you do, you have the power to then make it better. You just got to get it out there. All that matters is getting it out there. And if we go through and show you, if I teach you how to make it better, then you'll be less afraid. You're not going to be worried because every story starts that way. Do, do you think, and maybe this is an extra introspective episode of, of after, after things, um, I, I, are the three of us made of something just a little bit different where we're less afraid to go out and be bad? Cause I, I, I know that, I know that, 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 that's been foundational for Justin and I's comedy. Like, like we're like, yeah, we're going to be bad. It'll be terrible. It'll be hilarious. We'll laugh about it someday. Um, but, but I don't know that I've talked to you, Andrew, about that aspect. Um, is, is, uh, yeah, I mean the, the prize for us was always worth more. We would go through anything because of the prize, what we wanted. Yeah. You know, I would go on stage and embarrass myself, but I did woke up the next day. I didn't want to give up. Yeah. You know, I still wanted the thing. And that's the thing is that, and that's sort of how you kind of, and it doesn't mean to like, it's fine to give up and say, I don't really want it. Cause you might come back to it two years later when you have a different set of priorities say, no, I really want this now. Now I understand how much it means to me. Um, but I, I, when I started writing books, like I, I was at that point in my life, like I've got to do, I have no choice. I have no choice. I've got to make this thing work for me. So I don't care if I start off sucking, I'm just going to keep doing it. Yeah. I, 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 I uh, well, if if you have something, well, I mean, uh, I feel like I I have a pretty good a beat on on the emotional makeup of the the three of us. Um, I don't think that there is anything special about any of our ability to tolerate the pain that comes along with being bad. I don't think that any of us are particularly immune emotionally immune to that yeah i think that we have whatever little spark there is be it recklessness or bravery to take steps and i think that that's driven by what andrew said the idea of we want to be our heroes we want to be the we see this north star that we that we that we dream to be and we just know that and then eventually what what is learned is the repetition of saying all right i'll take this reckless step toward heaven and I, i'm gonna fall down and even though we know it hurts you know it hurts from the moment you think about this goal you know that it's gonna suck you know that you're gonna have to put yourself through the ringer you know that it's gonna be hard to to get notes to do all the things that you need to do 
uh, that in and of itself is kind of the the lesson. But it's like to to think that we're better at tolerating the pain, I think, is the wrong the wrong thing. It's it's more that we have that man. All this stuff is just it's all that split second. It's that you know I think about it to to, to this day. We're on the way back. Andrew and I are on the way back from South by Southwest. And there is like what, no matter how much was going on under the surface in Andrew's head, he decides to pull out his notepad or, 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 or laptop, I forget what it was, and just start writing that first short story that eventually launches th- this, this career that is, is, is now uh, before us. And it's like, that's that split second. The split second to say, no, now. Now is when I do it. Now is when I try a thing. And it's like, that matched with a goal of where you want to go and then the ability to say yeah look i'm going to tolerate things not being good things not being good not being up to my standards thing not being up to the world standards my friends looking at me or strangers looking at me like i'm i'm bad or untalented like like that always hurt that never goes away like that's that's always there on some level as long as you know that the hardest lesson to teach people is that we're not, we don't have to, some people are static, but you don't have to be static. Once you realize that you can improve and get better at something, then, and if you're willing to do the work, you, somebody like, yeah, I know I get better. I don't want to do that. Okay. If you don't know you can get better, then you're going to be afraid because you're going to like, well, what if it sucks? Well, fine. They don't expect it to suck. Just know that you can make it better. Well, that's going to be work. Well, I don't want to work. Well, then give up. That's what I'm like. If you don't want to do the work, give up. But if, <laughs> But I'm if you're, and I get this all the time. And you know, Twitter people ask for advice, like, "Well, I want to do this, but I'm like, I don't want to. I want somebody else to write my story of this. Like, yo, you don't want to do the work. Yeah. Well, that's silly, you know. And if you want, if you know you can get better and you're willing to do the work, that's all it takes. That's those are the two most important things. I I, I can't remember at which time I've told which part of this story, but you know, I I went up and did. Uh, a fast tracked performance on America's Got Talent and went up to to Dallas and you know kind of skipped the uh, the the audition and went straight to the big stage um, and and I did it with a, a proven piece uh, in in so far as it grabbed attention but it was an unproven piece in that it had no resolution it was the the fake hand stab yeah. and and so on and um, I remember being on stage and. Uh, immediately two buzzers went off and I realized, oh, both of these people think I just injured myself on stage and they've already committed themselves. Uh, and, and my new job in that moment became, I need to make sure that this doesn't see air. So I, I, I just spoke in run on sentences and tried to run out the clock on everything and refused to give them any sound bites that, that would go anywhere. However, that very long three and a half hour drive back, uh, I, I thought the whole time I have career cancer, like sometime between now, mid March and mid June, this is going to come out and I will be the punchline. And, and the guy who did scam school, my career is over. It's over. It's over. I have career cancer. And I was fixated on that. And, um, I wrote teller and, uh, and it was astonishing because I wrote him a good two and a half pages in vivid detail explaining just how totally screwed I was on yeah. this thing. And his response was very curt. And he was like, yeah, in my experience, this matters not at all. Uh, there was this one time we did a prediction on the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl. Did I mention it's the Super Bowl? We were live on the Super Bowl. We got it wrong. Nobody cared. Yeah. And, and I was like, well, okay, your antipathy does nothing to make me feel better. Uh, and then yet sure enough, uh, it didn't matter. And, and for the life of me, I can't find that footage of them screwing up their prediction. We got Dotson. Uh, uh, we got uh, Dotson uh, here. See, like, like, like I, 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 right. I mean, yeah. it's, 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 uh, but that's the way you get to act when you're already past it. But when you're in it, God, it feels like the end of the world. Again, and that's, and that's part of it. Part of it is just understanding that your emotional journey on this you will feel every stair that you fall down. <laughs> like every stair will hurt. And on some level, like even now, like, uh, 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 you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure for, for every uh, uh, YouTube comment that comes in, no matter how successful you've been, there's an element where you're like, eh, geez. Like in every email, I know 
every every time that I screw up something on a podcast and somebody points it out, it still hurts, even though I've been able to make a living doing it. And I'm sure the same with with Andrew on 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 your books. Whenever you get an email about something and you're like, ah, Jesus, I wish I would have had that back. You get some calluses. It, it it hurts a little bit less than the first time it hurt, but it always it always hurts. What is the other side of it? And I think, you know, for for me with podcast production, I was talking to Brian about this earlier today. The the big moment that changed for me was understanding that there is a point between a first draft, which is bad, and trusting my ability and talent to make it good. And and it, so what I found out was so much of my hesitation, so much of my delay was in the fear that this one was special. Right. That this one was going to be the one that I you had to get it right the first I, time. I, or Yeah. Or, or it's like, it's going to be bad. And it's going to stay bad. I'm not going to be able to make it work. And, and I've done it enough times now where it's like, oh, no, this is, I've got a skill. I've got it. I've got a talent. I can look at a thing and, and be it through all the times that I've, I've helped with uh, Andrew's stories and, and all the people that I've helped give notes to all the times that I've watched movies and hated them and tried to pick apart, you know, what was bad and, and how many times I sat in a Panera bread with Andrew and cast and, and, and came up with full franchises for us, like star Treks that never happened that we were just <laughs> making up for ourselves. It's like, Oh, all that has compiled in my brain. And now I can be like, Oh no, this is not the point of the story. The point of the story is this is that and the other. And it's like, that's helped bridge the gap where at least I don't have the anxiety. I know that I'm going to fall down those stairs. I've got the calluses, but at least I'm not scared about it. And that's the and biggest thing. with may, may, Maybe Andrew, maybe that's the right metaphor is, is at some point things cease to be a wound that you feel and they become a scar that you get to point to and brag about how you got. And I, and I would say like the, uh, you know, uh, the time in, in, in West Virginia where the audience hated my show and threw fruit at my stage, that is now a scar that, that, that I don't feel the pain, but I enjoy telling the story. And, and uh, the uh, uh, America's Got Talent uh, yeah. situation, like, like that's a scar now, not, not, not a wound. Uh, I'll give you a better example. Oh, shit. Uh -oh. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, number one. By, 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 curse. By, <laughs> by the way, uh, on the magic thing, you could have called me on that. I'd be like, was it over when Ricky J screwed up his card trick on Letterman? The guy who became the terror of every other magician, the fear of like this guy screwed up a trick. Ricky J. Oh, that's okay. right. He did totally everything wrong. It was supposed to be anyway. So here are the four aces, and he's like, "Yeah, there's a king, a two, a five, and a seven. Yeah. I don't get it." Was it was it over when Doug Henning on live TV fell off of a mirror base and his legs vanished? <laughs> no. <laughs> was it was it over when Blackstone with the Orange Bull and every oh magic my god, trick oh, 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 the hand is quicker over? than the eye. Uh. And then I was about to do an over and like, no, it really was over for those guys in Vegas. So we'll leave it right there. The point is, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> the point is, yeah, like that's like, yeah, like it's because like that is like every, what seems like the world to you to nobody else. Nobody else. You'd be lucky if people cared. Um, yeah. uh, so, you know, the story, but you know about uh, kickboxers and like when they look at like x-rays of their bones, like these, these Thai kickboxers, when we look at this, mm -mm. when you kick when you hit your those bones over and over again the same with the boxing you get micro fractures not full fractures micro fractures those go fill in with more calcium and over time those bones become really dense denser than a regular human's bones i i, I do know about this from my friend dennis rogers who does the strongman stuff like he grabs a a a, 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 a nail and just punches it through a board every time i'm sure he's breaking his bones a little bit yeah, and so I'd say that's one of these things where you start to see where you can get like this. Uh, in theory, the idea is that these done right over time, it just makes the bone stronger. You yeah. know, and that's the kind of thing where it serves a purpose. It makes the thing stronger. And so that's, uh, you know, another thing too, though, it's like a, a weird analogy. Do you know the problem, one of the problems astronauts have with their feet when they're on the space station? They don't know what they're, to do with them. Yeah, they're, they, they're they're holding like two mugs because they don't know the, what. They're dancing. They the, might the bot. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. They maybe they don't know where their feet are. 
Well, the skin on the bottom of their feet peels off. Yeah. Oh. Because you're no longer walking around oh. and they start to develop a hard surface on the top of their feet because when you're clipping around your toes around things and so oh. they'll wear like special socks and stuff because you're no longer using the bottom of your feet and that's a very you think of your foot like oh it's perfect like no like that's that's wear and tear from walking around if you don't walk around it gets soft and you lose its ability for it to like be firm and whatnot and so that like, that's how we grow with a lot of things we grow only grow by friction they only grow by use we only get better by doing that so, so. to to wrap things up um i mean i think what we've done is a lot of describing of uh us being willing to to you know get beat up a lot uh if if somebody is thinking that doesn't sound fun to me <laughs> like small small small, small how do you, how do you small, tell do them? a small thing do <laughs> yeah. a small thing like to uh uh i i you're you're saying this is a, a pennies thing where she yeah, has yeah 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 for 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 penny and uh, and also a, a, a spoiler so alert uh, we we have eli who who is roughly of the same age as penny and into magic and so i i kind of want to you know give a good advice so let, let's let's just say let's just use penny as an example of somebody who's got a big gigantic world in big their idea doesn't want to screw it up uh, I will leave the 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 final advice to Andrew, but if I'm going to channel Andrew, what I would suspect he would say is take a cool little part of that world and write that story. Write that tiny little story, that little short one. It could be a couple pages, but just that little, that conflict, uh, a fun little adventure that a side character's side character would go on. If you have a wide, big world, just eat around the edges, feel what it's like to, to write in that universe. And, uh, uh, for, for, for magic, I would say it's, I mean, again, I'm, I'm literally giving advice for, for the author and, and the magicians when I'm neither, but like, that's why we show up for this show. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I, I would say a small little thing, get, get good at, at, at a small little thing, but make it as, as complete of a of a, of a small thing as you can, so a beginning, a middle, and an end. Something that that then that little DNA. Because if you got that little DNA, God, does everything else become so much easier? Because now you're replicating it on a larger scale, and instead of thinking about like, oh, well, where do we even start? It's like if you do a little thing and you like that little thing. At the very least, you can always say, okay, well, it begins like my little thing began, and then it has a middle like my little thing had, and then it ends like my little thing did. And then it's like, okay, and then you can figure out, okay, well, does this make sense or not? But it just gives you that starting spot. And if you have that starting spot, God, does everything go faster. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's advice that plays with anything. When Sir Edmund Hillary wanted to climb Everest, first thing he did is he found you know, the tallest mountain in New Zealand, and he went there first. Yeah, you know, it's half the height of New Zealand. But like, let me let me work out. Let me figure out. Everybody has drafts. Everybody goes through revisions. So it doesn't matter if you're Stephen King or whoever. And so my advice to your daughter is like, understand that writing is first draft, later drafts. It's 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 iterating over that, which gives you permission to start in a place with lots of mistakes. And then you find that skeleton and you build from there and like, yeah, start something small. You know, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, he really wrote two stories, Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. There's all this other stuff. There's all this other, you know, all these other outlines. There's all these other like little almanac like types of stuff, but actual real stories. He only wrote two, but he created, you know, this fantasy universe that's worth hundreds of millions of dollars because it's such a rich place to tell stories in. But he only managed to write to what I would call real complete sort of stories. Um, to your daughter, it's like, yeah, she has this universe, she has these characters. Just start with a story about a character and then work from there. Don't tell tell her to make a bad version. Tell her to just write a fast version. Just just make a fat write a fast thing. Spend the next yeah. two days writing a thing. Pen, Give pen, her an excuse for it to suck in advance. Penny's not a fan of 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 uh making her characters filthy with a with a bad story, but, but, but maybe, maybe a disguised story. And, and this is something I'll confess to you guys. You know, we've talked about this book that I've been wanting to write. And part of me is afraid to be known as a marketing guy instead of an entertainment guy. And, uh, and then it occurred to me like a week ago that I was like, I don't have to publish it under my own name. I could just make the damn thing and publish it under whatever name I want. 
Brian, we got to talk. Okay. I, no, I already did it. I already did it. I already did it. He already said that over lunch. <laughs> I already had this exact talk. It's fine. That you're it's fine. Fine. Up. You know what? My my pick is uh, 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 my kid's story. It's great. <laughs> uh, so you think Matthew McConaughey is like, ah, oh, if I write this soulful book about life and me, oh, I don't want to be known as this guy. I got to use another name. <laughs> no. I, I, well, I, and 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 uh, this is the most I'm going to uh, give to it is what I don't want to do is just have it like gotcha the book. From the guy that 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 gotcha, <laughs> you know that's what I don't want to do. Well, uh, yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> uh, uh, I I do think for Penny though, if she doesn't want her characters to be sullied, li- literally just change the names, right? No, not even change the names. Further out the ring, right? So it's like if she's got her main characters and yep. then her side characters. Tell me a story about the side character, side character, somebody who's observing a side character that like now you can let them do. Whatever they want, a simple little thing about uh, that time. The side character did a little, so the time that they picked a mushroom. What's the most exciting thing that could happen by somebody that viewed them doing a thing that's happening in your story, at least to give you, because it's like what she Lowest doesn't realize things. is that she doesn't have the muscle to build the character. Yeah. And that's all you need. And if you write the side character, side character story, then that's giving you a safe space to just say, oh, well, here's a human, and the human needs a, a motivation. The human needs a conflict, and blah, blah, blah. Um, also, put your name on your book. But uh, my pick is... Uh, what was my other pick? Oh, I watched the first se- uh, episode of this season of uh, Handmaid's Tale. Um, I've had complicated feelings about this series, but uh, apparently in this season, she's a mob boss. And of all the versions where, uh, you know, the show has been various different kinds of shows, but her as kind of a sociopathic mob boss, I'm, uh, I'm on board with. Is this bringing you back? Because I know you were you were down on the last season. It's a mess of a show. It's, okay. just, it, it's just a mess. And it definitely seemed, I did, I'm not caught up with the show, but it definitely seemed like a show that probably should have been wrapped up after a couple of years. Well, it... It's always had a problem, like many shows of its era, that are shows about messages, right? That are shows about trying to get a point of view across. The line between the subtlety of where you want to tell that message and then understanding that there's got to be a good story wrapped around it, right? If you want it to be art that will live forever, then... The, the art that lives forever are the things that we remember, the stories that we remember, not necessarily the messages that we digested. Um, it's had a hard time with that, uh, and, and largely because it just kind of keeps deciding that it's different sorts of shows. Sometimes it's a sci-fi alternate reality kind of show. Sometimes it's a political show, and now it's... And Mob Boss is kind of a, a different way of looking at it. It's more of a, a now this is guerrilla warfare. Um, but you get some of the same beats. I mean, look, uh, uh, the acting's always been good, uh, but, um, you know, uh, uh, it's still, <laughs> they still haven't learned subtlety, but uh, that was never the point of the show anyway. Um, I've, got a, I've got a half of a pick. I've got a half of a pick, and it's only here because I didn't hate it. Uh, I watched the first two and a half episodes i guess of uh of a little netflix show called jupiter's legacy uh i was very surprised by this it's uh it wasn't what i thought it would be so it's about it's about a superhero family and also there's a um multiple there's a past and present timeline thing going on i I think it's interesting. I think it's not any- more nineteen twenties, less twenty year olds. That's my theme. That's what I want to see. Oh, I disagree completely on that. I, uh, I, I, I think it's. It gets a lot of points for not just being what the Marvel version of this would be. I have a feeling that the Marvel version of this will be Black Widow, whatever the story of Black Widow is. Andrew, oh, Andrew, but, 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 what are your but, thoughts? But, hold on, before Andrew speaks, real quick, Bryce, uh, you did or did not see Invincible. Of course, I saw Invincible. Okay, okay, yes. Okay. Invincible is a Invincible is a good show, a good cartoon. I think this is interesting because it doesn't feel like a superhero show first. Um, I don't, I don't love it. 
I don't love I don't love it, but I can I can watch it, and that's a half pick. I don't love these hoes. Andrew, what's up? Yeah, I'm halfway through it. So this was part of Netflix made this big deal with Mark Millar, who's a great, great comic book writer, et cetera. Yes, right. They spent, mm-hmm. yeah, they did, yeah, wanted um, an unannounced amount, but they bought, after the Marvel deal was ending, they bought the Miller World. And my issue, one, Stephen S. Tonight was the showrunner, and then he, like, quit in the middle of this and, like, Ooh. And there was some problem or whatever, or was they change, you know, creative differences, whatever, which is not a good sign. First episode, I don't want to do spoiler. Um, people die, and it's not acknowledged. Like five minutes later, we're in another scene, and the biggest thing people are dealing with has nothing to do with. And I'm like, I'm rewinding, like, wait, no, wait, did people just die there, right? Like these major characters are these characters just died. I'm like, oh yeah, no, they died. This just the writing just didn't want to talk about that. And then we get to the mm. second episode and then it's like, oh yeah, that anyhow, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, this show doesn't even understand the, like the characters aren't behaving in a world that's real for them. Um, and, and I like, I like everybody involved, but like, man, like, it's like, I'm like, I don't, I want, I want the early, like there's parts of the story that takes 1930s, parts of the story that take place, you know, modern day, just do the effing, old story that took place in the thirties, do that, then do the other story. And also the characters, like I didn't find them compelling or likable. That was my problem. Invincible. There's like one Mm -hmm. character in there that's just not likable at all. And we're supposed to be sympathetic towards them. And that's like, sometimes I think people need to go like, Hey, we're going to follow this character. Are they likable? Oh no, not likable. And that, that was really part of my issue. Do we want to? Yeah. Do we, there's, there's gotta be something that we want to see advance. Even if we, even if they're, even if they're scumbags, like we, we need to see some element of a thing or they're tied to somebody that we kind of care about. Uh, uh, it is hard when you don't see yourself in anything. Like, let's say there were like a teaser trailer where you had a bunch of godlike beings that have no element of humanity and they just show up on a weird ship and 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 they're just kind of there and then they say the eternals at the end like i'm just hypothetically spitballing this like like you just well, got a teaser so you got to see something all right all right how's so, it been people well, wait, wait 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 i tried watching army of the dead oh what you yeah. think so I, at the beginning, I'm like, well, at least they're getting this out of the way so we don't have to do a bunch of flashbacks. Yeah. No, then no. the flashbacks started. And then they're Zack Snyder doing really emotional scenes. And I'm like, all right, I'll watch this later. Uh, <laughs> so Yeah, I heard it was, I heard Army of the Dead was a lot of good action, but maybe not much else. Yeah. So, uh, I, uh, I, I, just the, uh, my last thing on Jupiter's Legacy uh, is it reminds me a lot of like watching a Shonda Rhimes show where, uh, in where the 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 characters will just it will always just be those characters and they will always just turn different angles and eventually everyone will have been in every angle with everybody else at some point. Uh, but interesting things happen, right? I think the first episode ends with an interesting thing happening, um, and. The character yeah. confusion so, stuff can can just be its own thing. My pick is my CO2 meter. It's it's really helpful if you want to see how much CO2 is around you and oh, if you wow. need to open up a window or a door. So that's my pick. Get a CO2 meter. Hey. Okay. There we go. Yeah. There you go. It's been after. All right. What's the line between a teaser and a trailer these days? Like you, we're gonna do a two minute teaser and it's not a trailer. Well, I mean, if they're calling the it a teaser, teaser. Comes, if they're calling it a the teaser, teaser comes, it. the teaser comes before the trailer. The teaser is often early on where you don't have your final footage ready, but you want to show, hey, there's a show. This is what's coming. Yeah. Then the trailer will come, which gives you more more background. And what the teaser is like, no, we shot it. We're shooting it. We're trying to put the thing together. Yeah. But what do Teasers you call it when you load the trailer and the first five seconds are a preview of what the next two minutes? Well, but no, you but call that, it every that's trailer that's that been coming out for the past five trailer? years. Is that, uh, no, that, okay. that's, that that's happened a, because of Twitter and autoplay yeah. where you're like, here's the thing. You're going to see this. Yeah. I'll die. Uh, All right, laters. Bye. All right. I guess I have somewhere to be. All right, everybody, we will be back. <laughs> yes, for... I do, Bryce. <laughs> I do. I love you. We love you. <laughs>
Uh, we've got to go. We will be back for Cord Killers in hey, about hey. two hours. Ho, ho. Uh, Justin R. Young on go. Twitch. Andrew Main on Twitter. Thank you, everybody. All right, goodbye. I will...